Good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, another edition of Catapult Education webinars. Uh, I'm excited to be with everyone tonight and I look forward to the next couple hours. Um, I know the, Lisa read off the title of the program tonight and I, to, to many of you, these uh, we're just gonna go through some cases and try to you know, kind of discuss cases and what our thought process was, what treatment options might've been, uh, how we arrived at our diagnosis and, and our treatment plan. Uh, to some of you or many of you, they may not seem like difficult or unusual, but hopefully these will be cases that you just don't encounter every day. And, and, and I hope that'll create a little bit of interest from the standpoint of you know, how we treated the cases and the different uh, treatment modalities we you know, utilize to try to uh, achieve a successful outcome. Uh, as, we, as we talked about, this is uh, part of the Catapult education webinars. And as a member of Catapult, not only do we do speaking, but we also do product evaluations. And uh, I have the opportunity to look at a lot of products, uh, work with a lot of companies. Uh, and we, we, we work with these products sometimes, uh, we see them before they're even on the market and evaluate the products and look at them and work with them. Uh, but I have no conflicts of interest and I'm gonna be talking about a lot of these products tonight. And I wanna thank our sponsors uh, that make these programs possible. As, as Lisa said, we have Bisco, Pulp Dent and Zest Dental Solutions. Uh, that are sponsors tonight. These are all great companies. And they all, interestingly enough, there's something about each one of these companies that I feel like they're leaders in the industry in certain areas. And I'm gonna mention just a couple of things of each one and, uh, and then we'll get, in, get into the program. But as far as Bisco goes, um, when I think of Bisco, I think of adhesives. I think they're certainly an industry leader when it comes to adhesives and their universal adhesive, which I'll talk a little bit about in our program tonight. Uh, later on, we show uh, a case. We show how we bond the case in. Uh, I love universal adhesives. I'm a huge fan of universal adhesives, and I and I'll talk a little bit about that. And I've been using Allbond Universal for a little over eight years now, and had tremendous success with it. I think it's a great adhesive and a great universal adhesive. In addition, another product Bisco I like a lot is uh, their self adhesive resin cement. The little bit difference about this self adhesive resin cement, it's a fairly new product. It's interesting because of its, um, it has fluoride and calcium release, which you don't usually see in these simple to easy one. And we'll talk about cements too. And we'll talk about conventional cementation versus what I call adhesive resin cementation. So with conventional cementation and self-adhesive resin cements, you don't have to treat the tooth or treat the restoration, which really simplifies the cementation process. Uh, this is a great cement, um, elevated pH is very kind uh, to the tooth and uh, very tissue uh, friendly. It's easy to clean up, uh, just a really nice product. Uh, as far as pulp dent, uh, when it comes to, you know, the new buzzword in dentistry right now, we hear a lot about is bioactivity and pulp dent is a leader in the industry, I believe in, in bioactivity and bioactive products. Uh, they're one of only two companies that I know of right now that have FDA approval to claim bioactivity in their products. And their Activa line is a tremendous uh, line of, of of uh, these bioactive products, it, it includes a base, liners, restoratives, and their new uh, bioactive cement. So the Activa bioactive cement that releases not only calcium and fluoride, but also phosphate ions. So some really good products there. And their temporary material called Tough Temp Plus, I love this. It's very, uh, it, it gives you really lifelike temporary restorations, uh, get great provisionals. Uh, the plus comes from the fluorescence that they've added to this. It's a dual cure, meaning it will self cure uh, if you have a solid matrix or you can have a clear matrix and actually use a light and light cure this product. It's very easy to trim. It's very adapts well on the mouth. And Pultin has another interesting uh, uh, a proprietary ingredient uh, that they have called this rubberized urethane technology that they incorporate not only into their temporary material that makes it tougher and makes it longer lasting and gives it kind of a shock absorbing uh, quality, but it's also in their uh, Activa line too. So they incorporate it into their resins. Uh, this rubber this rubber technology, this urethane is is pretty pretty neat thing. And as for Zest, when I think of Zest, I think the leader in the industry and locators are so well known for their locators and they've got a, a tremendous uh, new locator, uh, the FTX, which uh, is kind of revolutionizing, I think, you know, full arch fix restorations. Uh, it's eliminating the need for screws or cements. Uh, really great, uh, you know, when you think of locators, you, 
immediately think of Zestinal Solutions. And on, another product of theirs that I like a lot, um, uh, when they uh, merged with uh, Danville Materials, they got a lot of the demo, and Danville was known for their micro etchers. And uh, I have a Prep Start H2O, and, and it's just something that's hard to practice without. Uh, whether you're going to use air abrasion for, for cavity preparation or whether you're using it for cleaning surfaces or cleaning restorations, uh, air abrasion and, and micro etching is, is really of value uh, to our practice on a daily basis. And the thing I like about the Prep Start H2O is that they've incorporated water. You know, anytime you're micro etching or air abrading, uh, it can get pretty messy. You know, the aluminum oxide powders just get everywhere and can be messy uh, intraoral and extraorally. So uh, having the water uh, incorporated in this, this, this uh, slurry is, is a great way for being able to etch and, and air braid without it being nearly as messy. So these are some of the things about our sponsors tonight that I really like. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more as we go through uh, and, and, and discuss some other products too. So the cases we're going to be talking about tonight, the first one is going to be a non-surgical restoration of an anterior crossbite. The next case will be treatment of anterior wear caused by protrusive grinding. And then we'll look at shade matching of a dark anterior tooth. One of the most difficult things to do uh, in anterior teeth is when you have one dark tooth, trying to match it to lighter teeth. It can be hard, hard to uh, get a good, good shade match. And we're talking about treatment options for a uh, look at a couple of cases of excessive gentle display uh, or what we call the gummy smile. And then we'll look at conservative restoration of a non-consonant smile arc. And then we'll, we'll finish up with uh, an auto transplantation case of a traumatic evulsion. So uh, kind of an interesting case, uh, one of a kind for me. I've only done this one time and I, I have a very small role to play in this case, but it's a kind of neat case and we'll, we'll finish up with that one. So what, what I like to talk about uh, before we get into the cases, what I'm going to try to do when I go through each case is how we set our cases up and, and what's, what is our thought process. And it usually revolves around this systematic approach to diagnosis and treatment planning. And it starts with actually the diagnosis and then what's the problem? What, what's going on? What are the existing clinical conditions? What are the problems that we encounter when the patient comes in? But then instead of going right from our, a lot of times we talk about, it's even in the title of the lecture, diagnosis and treatment planning. We go straight to treatment planning, but one of the things I think we overlook sometimes is more importantly than going, what's our treatment plan after we make our diagnosis is how do, what are the treatment goals? And so I think it's critical that we establish the treatment goals before we go to our treatment plan. And to me, our treatment goals are based on the patient's desires and what you know, based on our diagnosis, the dentist clinical diagnosis, but we don't want to forget the patient. What is it the patient wants or what is the patient? Because a lot of times you can get what you think is a good clinical result and the patient may not be happy because we ignored some of their desires. And it could be, another reason I think this is so important is if the patient desires are unrealistic, it might be better that we don't even do the case at all or treat, treat the patient at all. That's why I think it's such an important part. And then we go on to our treatment plan which will be whatever it takes to accomplish our treatment goals. We've made our diagnosis. We've determined our treatment goals, what we need to do to arrive at a successful outcome. So now we just, what does it take to do that? And that's basically our treatment plan. And after we have a treatment plan, we can determine our sequence of treatment. And the sequence of treatment is based on the treatment plan. And it's whether it's our restorative only or whether it's gonna be you know, periodontics first or orthodontics, oral surgery, however that is. Uh, our, our treatment plan will determine our sequence of treatment. So let's get into our first case. And this is uh, Keith, who's age 55 when we first saw him. And Keith is a happy guy and he is perfectly well adjusted. Keith comes to us for one reason and one reason only because his wife made him come in. He's, she's not happy with his teeth. She knows his teeth are in bad shape. He is in no pain. He has no tooth pain. He has no joint pain. He has no muscle pain. He's eating whatever he wants and he's having no problem, but he has a lot of dental problems and a lot of dental issues, but is his mind, he's doing okay. But the biggest thing for Keith is that he was adamant about is that he's been told his whole life that he needs to have jaw surgery. And the reason why is he's severe class three with an anterior crossbite. And he is determined that no matter what he does, he's not going to have jaw surgery but he does want to make his wife happy and he is willing to entertain the thought 
of possibly doing something to fix some of these teeth because he knows himself he can look in the mirror see his teeth are in pretty bad shape so we're trying to come up with a treatment plan for keith that will satisfy his desire which is not to have surgery and his wife's desire which is to make his teeth look better so what, what we came up with is our diagnosis of class three malocclusion and anterior crossbite with old and failing restorations and an unattractive smile. Our treatment goals were to restore the worn and failing restorations. We wanna correct the class three crossbite without surgery if we can. We wanna increase in size or display because he's not showing much tooth. We want him to have a nicer looking smile, but we really can't in the jaw relationship he is right now because we don't have room to make his teeth any longer. And we'd like to improve smile aesthetics because his wife would like him to look better. And we want to prove his overall appearance, but especially his gingival health, because he has some, you know, mild periodontitis and, uh, you know, some inflamed gingiva. And we're, we're going to try to work with him on that to try to get that better. So our treatment plan that we came up with, we'd done cases where we'd open bites and we treated cases. And our primary reason for opening bites often is prosthetic convenience. We just, we didn't have to, we, with wear cases, often the bites close down, you, you have short teeth and teeth are rough to stay in contact. You have no room to restore teeth and we, we need to create room. And one of the ways we can create room for anterior restorations is to open the bite. You can open the bite as little as a millimeter in the posterior and get as much as three millimeters of room anteriorly. So having done these cases before, I knew that. My question was, if we open his bite, would it give us room to jump the cross bite? And I didn't know the answer, but I knew a way we could figure out, and that was doing a diagnostic wax up. So that was part of what we thought. We would do, we can do veneers and crowns. We know we could restore the teeth. If he had perfect occlusion and he came to us with a mouth like he had, we would just do, you know, get his gums healthy and do restorations. So we knew we could do that, but how are we going to get his bite if we can improve his bite? Well, what we decided was we would get a diagnostic wax up to determine if we could, in fact, get some type of, of, of an ideal or of a more ideal jaw relationship. So the sequence that we came up with is we're going to go through the hygiene department. We're going to try to get his gums healthier. Then we're going to make an appointment for the diagnostic wax up criteria. And we'll go through that. And then after we got that back, if we felt like we could restore him and by opening his bite, we would go ahead and proceed with treatment. And he was aware of all that. In fact, we made the patient aware of it up front. We said, Keith, we, this is what we can do. We're going to find out. We're going to need this wax up. It's going to be like our, our, our blueprint for us to follow in determining if we can treat your case successfully or not. So what are our reasons for altering vertical? Why do we open bites? Okay, this is what I learned from Frank Spear. One is we do it to improve aesthetics. Secondly, we do it to improve occlusal relationships. And third, another reason for opening the bite is to gain space for re restorations. Well, all three of these reasons for altering vertical, we needed in Key's case. So he fits the parameters to begin with. So and bite opening to gain space, what are we looking at? Well, the first thing we always do in any anterior restoration, regardless, if we're restoring a smile, whether it's a full mouth rehabilitation or whether it's just a, a, a smile restoration, we always start with incisal edge position. It's either right it's, or it's deficient or it's too long. More than likely, it's either gonna be right or it's gonna be deficient, meaning it's not long enough. So how the, the reason it's so important is in his book, The Science and Art of Porcelain Laminate Veneers, Galip Gorel said, this is a direct quote from his textbook, the incisal edge of the maxillary central incisor is the most important determinant in the creation of a smile. The position of the incisal edge acts as a parameter upon which the rest of the treatment is built. So everything starts with the incisal edge. So the question becomes, how do you determine incisal edge? And if it's not in the right place, how do you get it there? Well, it is arbitrary to some extent, but what I use in my practice and what I've learned from, I've had many great mentors over the years. I've learned a lot of the, almost all the dentistry I do is I've learned from smarter people. And one of the things I learned was using the lip at rest to determine incisal edge position and then just do a mock-up to put it where we thought it needed to be. So I don't have, um, I didn't, you know, we were doing Keith's case to be really honest with you. I wasn't even sure I was going to turn out. We took the pictures necessary to, you know, communicate to the laboratory but I didn't know I'd be showing that case in a lecture. In fact, I wasn't even sure <laughs> I'd be wanting to tell anybody about the case because I had no, I'd never done a case like that. I had no idea how it was going to turn out. So here's another case we did. It is a female and it is an upper and lower case where we needed room and we needed to determine size ledge position because we were going to open the bite. 
So we look at her lipid rest, we see no tooth display. Same thing with Keith. Keith with his lipid rest looked just like this. You could see no tooth. We know with a female, we would like to see about three to four millimeters in a young female, but at least in an older female, two to three millimeters. And in this case, we saw none. So we'll go ahead and put some composite on the centrals and we'll just shape it. And then we'll look at it again. And we say, okay, now we can see some tooth. Still not enough but we can see, you know, we're getting somewhere. So we'll go ahead and we'll put a little bit more there and we'll say, okay, now that would be enough even for a, for a, a young female, certainly for a female of, of, of this patient's age, we're in the ballpark here. So again, this is arbitrary. We're gonna work everything out in the provisionals, but we need a starting point. So now we're in the ballpark and we can measure, once we have the mock-up, we can measure that length and we could communicate it to the laboratory. So Pete Dawson, who, you know, sadly passed away, but is, was a, a true giant in the field of dentistry. And one of the things he always said was if joints are healthy, but signs of instability exist, condyle position needs to be central relation, which I agreed with because a lot of what the way I practice dentistry, I learned from taking courses at Dawson Academy. So I have a lot of respect for Pete and, and what he taught. And so there are, his joints were healthy. And he had no muscle pain or joint pain, but he did have signs of instability. So if we're going to open his bite, we're going to try to build this occlusion in central relation. So how do we find CR? Well, there are a lot of different ways to find CR. And one is by manual manipulation. That's what Pete Dawson taught. There's a Lucia jig technique, a leaf gauge, Koist D programmer. You can make your own D programmer. And there are a lot of different ways to find CR. I liked the way the Lucia jig simply because I learned this from Frank Spear and it was easier than me than do it by manual manipulation because I didn't have to manipulate the jaw. The patient basically manipulates their own jaw and they find CR without even having to touch the patient by using this Lucia jig. And I'll show you a quick couple of slides here. This is a Lucia jig, Great Lake Orthodontic, I mean, prosthodontics. And we take this Lucia jig, we paint it with a little adhesive. We put some facet of uh, registration material. This is Futar D from Kettenbaugh. And we put that over the incisal of lasers. We level it with the occlusal plane. And we just have the patient slide back and forth on articulating paper. Slide forward, slide back, slide forward, slide back. And the posterior teeth are separated by a millimeter or two. And so there's no posterior contact. They're only contacting on that thin little blue line right there. And after several minutes of this slide forward, slide back and a very relaxed laid back, patients you know, laid back in the, in the chair, they're re very relaxed and then finally we say slide forward, slide back, and then we say squeeze. And when they squeeze, they're gonna seek the condyles. And so the muscles of mastication will seek the condyles and we can take our futar and where the bite is open posteriorly, we just go ahead and squeeze the futar in there. And that's how we uh, obtain our CR record. So this Lucia jig technique for me works really well. It's a great technique. Uh, and then we take our face bow. I, I like the Artex. I learned this years ago. It's simple and easy to use. And it's easy because you take the bite fork and you put it on the transfer table and that's all you have to send to the laboratory. Another easy technique uh, that, that you might want, especially if you need to deprogram the patient, if they do have muscle pain or soreness and you might need them in something uh, a little bit longer, you can fabricate this little Koist deprogrammer from the laboratory. Uh, it's got a little anterior platform on it, separates the posterior teeth. They can wear this for a few days, a week or so. They come back in, slide forward, slide back on that platform, have them tap, tap, tap on it, slide forward, slide back, squeeze. Same thing again just like the Lucia jig. You can get your CR record and the Kois, uh, the, the, with uh, Panadent, uh, their articulator and their Kois D programmer uh, and also the dental facial analyzer instead of a, a face bow, which is not really a fully uh, a face bow, it's more an ear bow technique that we use. But in the Kois system, they use this dental facial analyzer. And again, this is a great way to find CR and a great way to uh, record your, uh, maxillary cast with either a face bow or the dental facial analyzer. And then they mount the lower cast by you with your uh, CR record. And that's how the laboratory will mount these models in CR. And that's what they do to do a, a functional diagnostic wax up. Once they get this information, they can then mount your, your models in CR. And that's where we want to build this new occlusion is in CR. So this is what we do when we, when we talk about a diagnostic wax up appointment to get all the criteria we need, we're gonna get study models. In my office, we don't pour models uh, cause I just don't like to do it. And I, I take really accurate either polyether or polyvinyl. Uh, I love uh, Kettenbaugh's impression materials. 
Uh, there's a lot of clinicians choice, a lot of them out there. A lot of companies have really good impression materials, but we take very accurate impressions. This is critical. It's almost our study models impressions. We take them almost like they're going to be our final impression uh, 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 you know, of our prep teeth. And we don't want any bubbles, any tears. We want them accurate. And we want some uh, an impression material, not an alginate or an alginate substitute. We want something they can do multiple pours in and are going to be dimensionally stable. So our laboratory can pour up great study models. Our CR bite, which we showed you, our Facebook, which we showed you, our incisal edge position that we've determined with the mock-up, which we showed you. Once you have incisal edge position, if you're doing no gingival recontouring, then we just go ahead and measure from the incisal edge to the gingival margin. And that gives us length of centrals. We're going to take impressions and pictures of our mock-up, and we're going to take a series of photographs and a written RX. That's our diagnostic wax-up criteria, and that's what the laboratory gets every time. We do no deviation from this, and it helps us get really good results and consistent results. So this is what it looks like. Here's the study models. As the laboratory pours those up, they do great study models. And this is the case we were showing you where we, where we uh, did the uh, mock-up. There's the Lucia jig where we're finding CR. There's the face bow. Here's our central. You go, wow, that's awful long. Well, it's because of that she doesn't show any tooth. And for her to be able to show enough tooth to have an attractive smile, her we determined with incisal edge position in the mock-up that the centrals needed to be 13 millimeters. But you go, well, how do you know it's going to work? Well, we don't. But it gives the laboratory an idea. So the laboratory says, okay, you want a 13 millimeter central. I'm going to open the bite enough to give you that and a good functional occlusion. And then when they determine how much opening that is, they just set the pin and that becomes the new vertical dimension. So here's our pictures and impressions of our mock-up. You don't have to do four teeth. I just went ahead and did that because I wanted to give the laboratory a little bit more information. It's not critical. It's not necessary. You could do just one tooth. But I usually like to give the laboratory something to go on. Here's our series of photographs. There's our written RX. That's the wax up criteria. So this is what we this is what we sent to the lab, and this is what the laboratory sent back. This is their functional diagnostic wax up. I asked for 13 millimeters. I got exactly 13 millimeters, exactly what I asked for. And they gave us our incisal edge position where we wanted it. They gave us the length of central we wanted. They gave us aesthetic teeth, or aesthetic looking teeth. But they more importantly or just as importantly, they gave us a functional occlusion with overbite, overjet, anterior guides, posterior disclusion, all the things that we want that we'll, we'll talk about. So th this is the way to pay. This is exactly what we did with Keith. Here's how they started. These are their models before they open the bite. Here they are after the bites, after the models are mounted in CR, the bites open, functional wax up is done. And then they make a putty, they give us a putty matrix, which we make our provisionals from, which I'll show you in just a minute. And then there's a patient at their post-op check with their provisionals. And that's exactly what we're going to do for Keith. And the reason we're able to do it is the, the information we gain from the mock-up and from the uh, diagnostic wax-up criteria. And a good laboratory can give you these kind of results. So here's Keith's models. Same thing you just saw. I tried to go through that step-by-step step so you could see exactly what we did with Keith. Everything you just saw is exactly step-by-step, step, exactly what we did with Keith. And this is the wax up we got back from Keith, for Keith. Here's his models pre-op, and here's the centrals. Well, he were nine, and now they're 11. And here he was. This was his bite before, and here's his bite with his wax up. So now you see, we're at, and I'm starting to say, you know what? I think we might be able to do this. We might be able to get him in an, in, in an ideal overjet, over, uh, overbite overjet type situation. Um, and the interesting thing about class three is they're basically, these people have been chewing up and down their entire life. They have never chewed side to side in their life. They are, they don't brux laterally. They don't slide laterally. They just open and close. So basically, you know, you just want to make sure you give them equal intensity centric stops. You just don't want them putting pressure on one or two restorations. You want them kind of hidden equally all the way around. And I'll show you how we do that. In just a minute. So here's the the, the putty matrix. This is Siltec putty, and they they uh, reline these putty matrices with a, a, a polyvinyl uh, wash material that gives us a really accurate impression of the diagnostic wax up. They'll make an incisal, a facial reduction guide, and a sizal reduction guide, and then they make a little bite wafer. So basically, what they do for me now, and in, in, uh, instead of making little jigs to uh, prep the case with, they'll take the models 
They'll mount them in CR, like I said, they'll determine the amount of opening they need for the functional wax up and then they'll set the pin at the new vertical dimension. And then with the pin set, they'll go ahead and take this little putty and they'll make a little wafer out of it. And then they'll set, they'll put it over the occlusal surface of the pre-op models and they'll close it into that putty and at the new vertical dimension and let it set. So now that I have this wafer, when I prep the case, I prep it a quadrant at a time, posterior right, right posterior left, then anterior, and I reline the matrix as we go, and that's our CR uh, bite. We're getting a CR record as we prep the case, and that's what we use this uh, putty, the putty matrix for. Now, another thing I learned uh, in Golly Gurel's uh, textbook, he talked about the APT, which was what he, what I call an indirect mock-up. He called an aesthetic pre-evaluative temporaries. In other words, I just say. We mock it up. You can do a direct mock-up right over the teeth, or you can do an indirect mock-up with a matrix from your wax up. So I'm going to show you the reason and the information that you can gain from before a burr ever touches the tooth. You can visualize the final result by doing one of these APTs or, or, or an indirect mock-up. So here's a case right here that we did. All right, so this, um, this patient came in, and we're going to do... Uh, show you kind of really quickly to demonstrate. So we're trying it in right now. This is our, just to make sure it seats and, and, and the, the matrix seats all the way. So let me pull this up right here. So we'll go ahead and try that in, make sure it seats. And I'm gonna go ahead and fill that with my temporary material. And so once it's all filled in, I'm gonna go ahead and seat that back over the teeth, all right? The teeth can be slightly moist or you can dry them. There's nothing to make it bond on. I don't want it to stick. I want to get this off. And then I go ahead and take my matrix off. Just like that. And now I got a mock-up of what the, what the final result is going to look like. And now I can visualize. I can, the patient isn't numb. They don't have to be numb to do this. So you can have the patient smile. And we can, we can evaluate that. Another thing we can do is we can determine how much tooth we need to prep. So here it is. Here he is pre-op and we're gonna prep this case. We've opened his bite too, cause we don't have room to make the interior teeth the length we need. But now we can go ahead and we can look at this. And because we do our, our APT or our indirect mock-up before we ever touch any teeth, we can kind of visualize the end result. And I can go ahead and do depth cuts right through this material. So in cases where the, the, the depth cutting bird doesn't go all the way through the material, I know I don't have to reduce tooth at all. And in some cases, uh, we have to have minimum, min very minimal reduction. So it keeps you from over prepping teeth uh, where you may not need to do it by doing uh, one of these mock-ups before you ever start. And it really helps you visualize. So before I start with this part, I will go ahead. But once I can see the patient like this and, and even take some pictures or do some phonetics or anything like that you want, pre-op, you could do that. But all that's going to be done in the provisional stage. So here's now after... We prep the teeth, we get our impressions, we're going to make our temporaries. So the same thing again, we're going to be making, we're going to use the same matrix and here we are making our provisionals. So now we don't want it to stick to the teeth. We want to get it out so we can trim this. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to seat it in. And we're going to let this set for a minute. Now we might put some kind of separator on the teeth because I don't want it to stick to the teeth. So I'm going to go ahead and take this out. And when you take it out of the mouth, you can see it stays in the matrix. And we just go ahead and we, we, we tease this out. You can get it out usually a lot of times just in one piece. And you can see the front, the back teeth are full crowns and the front teeth are kind of like veneers, but I want to be able to trim this and I want to trim it out of the mouth. So that's why we get this out and we trim this up and then we can just go ahead and, and cement this with a temporary cement right in the mouth. But that's how we use the matrix for our wax up, I mean our mock up, and we can also use it for our provisionals. Now we go ahead and try this in. Before I do too much trimming, I just wanna make sure it seats all the way and everything goes all the way down. And once we determine that it has, then we can go ahead and take that out and we can trim it up really good and clean the interproximals up so the patient can clean and maintain you know, healthy tissue. And now we've got the upper one, which we've already made the exact same way. And we're gonna go ahead and put the upper one in. So this was a, this was an upper and lower arch. This is a bite opening case too, just like Keith. And just like Keith, we're doing upper, upper and lower teeth. 
So we'll go ahead and we'll try that in. We'll put the lower in as well. And then we can go ahead and check the occlusion and go through our occlusal steps. So now that we have that in, we'll go ahead. A lot of times what I like to do on the first visit is I like to set the patient up and I like to get some little thicker articulating paper. And I just want them to sit up and chew around on it. I want them to create their, the way they like to chew, okay? Their, their envelope of function. In other words, we'll say like tap, 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 slide forward, slide to the left, slide to the right. But that's not always the way a patient chews. So what I want them to do is actually simulate a chewing motion, chew around on there. And so what am I looking for? As Pete Dawson said, I want dots in back and I want lines in front, okay? So that's what you're looking for. I don't want any lines. I don't want any uh, occlusion on inclined planes. I like central uh, fossas, marginal ridges, and cuss tips. That's what we're looking for. And so I, when I don't see that, I can go ahead and adjust this and try to get them as close as I can on the first visit. And that's what we're trying to do. Another thing I told you that we do, when we're talking about equal intensity centric stops, you can use something like a T-scan. And this is a, a bite device that allows you to measure bite force uh, on your right on your computer. So this is a little uh, uh, digital bite force here where you have them closed down on that little metal wafer right there. The patient closes on that. And then on your computer screen, right there, chair side, you will get a 2D and a 3D readout. And a lot of times, if you see that little green spike right here, what that's showing is, is where the patient is hitting high. And this so happens, it tells you the tooth number too, that uh, she's hitting high on tooth number 13. So when you, you have them tap on articulating paper, you can look and see right where you need to adjust. And we really what you're looking for is equal intensity all the way around the mouth, which we see pretty well on this slide right here. So what I, when we evaluate the provisionals, the main three things we're looking for, I call the three Fs, is we're looking for facial aesthetics, function, and phonetics. Phonetics start, sounds like it starts with an F, that's why I call it the three Fs. And facial aesthetics, it's not enough, enough just to look at the smile when you do these types of cases. You wanna see how the smile relates to the face. So you wanna take a picture of the patient smiling, showing the laboratory the smile in relation to their whole face. And then obviously function, we were just talking about that. A lot of things we were just showing you with the T-scan and with the articulating paper and all, uh, that's where we're doing, what we're using to evaluate their function. So here's a typical post-op check. We always get our patients back, usually about two to three days afterwards, because we want them to have a chance to get over the numbness, for the numbness to, to get easier. So the patient comes in and we're evaluating this. All right, we're evaluating the provisional. So here we are, we're gonna check the bite force we're gonna have this patient close down. Now, this isn't a full mouth rehab. This is actually a veneer. This is uh, 10 veneers, but we do them all the same way. But I wanted to show you, this was interesting, okay? Because where did we find out this patient was hitting high? Not on any of the, of the provisionals or not any of the restored teeth. Let me back that up just for a second, okay? But we saw it, she was hitting high on a second molar, tooth number 15. That's where she was hitting high. And so, what we did is we went ahead and we just adjusted that tooth a little bit. And then we ask, we always ask, you know, how do you, how do you like your temporaries? Well, that's her answer. She gives us a big smile and a little wink. And she says, I really like my temporaries. Well, once we get patient approval, we can take pictures and impressions of this, send it to the laboratory. Now we're doing phonetics, 55, 66, 44, very fine Mississippi, you know, or have them say, if they're having trouble with S sounds, have them say 66 while you hold articulating paper in there. And it can tell you, you know, where, where the patient's hitting. Is it on the linguals of the upper interiors or is it on the incisal edges, depending on how they hold their jaw. So we're doing FedEx. Now what I'm doing is I'm checking that fit number 15 and I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm gonna adjust that a little bit and polish it back there in the back of the mouth where she was hitting high on that second molar. So we're, so really her anterior occlusion was good. So that's how we use our post-op check to, to check our provisionals. And what are the benefits of provisionals? Well, we call it the trial smile. They're the template for the final, and it gives us great laboratory communication, all the things we want to tell the laboratory and give them the information on, and it gives us a great opportunity for patient feedback. And the patients allow, it allows a patient to tell us exactly what they think of the teeth before the restorations are ever made in the laboratory. And it allows us to evaluate aesthetics, function, and phonetics. So the provisionals are critical to the success of the case. And they were, in Keith's case, especially because we were changing his bite. And we were changing him from where he was in an anterior crossbite to where he wasn't. And so we really wanted to know, and, and we wanted to know how he was comfortable, 
you know, how he looked, how he could chew, how he, was he eating comfortably? Was he functioning comfortably? All these things we could find out. And so once we got approval of the provisionals and once we knew he was comfortable and I get asked all the time, so how long do you have patients in provisionals? My answer, I don't want it to sound flippant, but it's usually however long it takes the laboratory to make the restorations if the patient's having no problems. And that's a giant if. I'm not going to you know, rush to completion if the patient's having any kind of problems, phonetic problems, functional problems, uh, aesthetic problems, you know, anything, any problems with speech like S sounds or, or, or anything like that. So, but if the patient's having no problems, if they're eating comfortably, if they're speaking properly, you know, and, and, and they're comfortable and their bite feels good and they like the way they look, I see no reason to keep patients in provisionals for extra long times, even in bite opening cases. So on average, it's about three weeks. That's how long. And that's probably about how long Keith was in. He comes back in, we put his restorations in, and there's this new bite. So we were able to get a, a good result with Keith that he was happy with. And like I said, he's a nice guy and he's happy, but he got what he wanted and his wife got what he wanted. She wanted him to have a prettier smile and he got what he wanted. He didn't have to have jaw surgery. There he is, upper and lowers. We didn't do the second molars. We rarely do. You probably noticed in that in the slide. I learned a long time ago that you can rest you can open these bites going to the first molar. And so I quit going, it was just easier to do the case going to the first molar. And I, for years I've been doing it that way because I found out by accident, we did one case, we used to always do all, all the way to the second molar, but we found out that you could get a good result going to the first molar and you could restore the second molars later. Or sometimes if it was a small amount of opening, the second molars would just uh, erupt into occlusion but we could always restore them later, but it was easier. And when I seat that putty matrix, I have a positive stop against those second molars and I'm not seating it against all prep teeth. So it helps me get really good, accurate provisionals. It's less teeth, it's less prepping. I don't have to prep second molars. It's less money for the patient, so they like it. It's easier for me. It's less time because if I'm doing upper and lower, I don't have to prep four second molars. So, and it worked in Keith. And even though Keith had had uh, uh, ortho extractions of a premolar, you know, we only did 10 teeth on the top. And I think we came back eventually and did second molars on him. But that's his case. And here Keith, here's Keith 10 years post-op. So he did well. We still see him. He still comes to hygiene. Uh, he's still happy when he comes in. He still doesn't brush and floss very well. His tissue's still in great and the hygienist fuss at him. But, you know, he's doing great and he's happy and uh, he's pleased with the outcome. And that's to us the most important thing. But again, there was Keith and I go, you know, I didn't know if it would work when it worked. And we saw another case a couple of years later, we said, hey, we know what to do because <laughs> we had worked before. And then we saw another case and we did that case too. So anyway, it can, this can work. It is something that can give you good results. And um, I guess once you, you get a good result with someone like Keith, you feel confident to try to do it again. So let's look at a wear case, uh, worn dentition. This is Dave, 59 years old when we saw him the first time. And this is what his teeth looked like. You know, the interesting thing about wear cases, people that grind their teeth, uh, you can kind of see their expression. If you look at the full face picture, you can see his eyes look tired, his face looks tired, his muscle, his expression, everything just looks kind of tired. And, and a lot of that is fatigue is caused because people grind their teeth, you know? And this is what he was doing. He was grinding his teeth. And he was grinding in what we call a protrusive manner. And the reason we know he was grinding protrusively is because people that grind protrusively, they wear the edges flat and even. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So he has incisive wear uh, due to attrition with a protrusive wear pattern. So our treatment goals were, and plus he had all these, not only did he have wear of his anterior teeth, significant wear, but he also had old failing restorations. And this is a case where we went ahead and did a bridge on him, which actually I didn't like to do because the abutment teeth weren't really strong, but we wanted to get everything restored and we wanted to use those teeth to open his bite. And we told him that he was going to need implants down the road and, and he understood that and he agreed with that, that we would do a bridge to start with, but that we would come back and we can section the bridge out, leave the crowns on the abutment teeth and then do implants in the ponic sites. And that was our long-term treatment plan. I don't know if I have it in here or not. So we want to increase in size of display. Again, Keith, I mean, uh, like Keith, showing very little, Dave was showing very little tooth when he smiles. We want to create an overbite and overjet in harmony with his own meaning that if he's going to protrusively brux, Frank Spears says, you know, you want to create occlusion that 
is in harmony with his envelope of function, you know, that doesn't make him want to break or, or, or stress restorations. So we want to improve overall aesthetics. And, and one of the things, let me back up for just a second and say, part of that includes a nighttime appliance, okay? I don't care how good you have the occlusion or how good of an occlusion you build. It isn't enough when they're asleep, if they're, if they're grinding or clenching on their teeth to protect the restorations, you need something at night. And so for cases like this, we always, you know, we pretty much tell them up front, you know, they're going to be in a nighttime appliance probably for the rest of their life. And they just, if they don't want to break restorations and have to pay for them again, they're just going to have to get used to that. So our plan called for a composite mocks up determined size ledge, just like you saw uh, earlier, you know, with, with Keith's case and the, and the other case we showed the wax up to, the, uh, to open the bite sufficiently to accomplish our aesthetic and functional goals. And that's what we tell them. When I say, people say, how much do you open the bite? I tell the laboratory exactly what Frank Spear says, who Frank Spear, I've, you, you'll hear me mention his name several times throughout the lecture. I've tremendous, I've learned so much from him over the years. He's a phenomenal teacher and lecturer. And uh, one of the things he says is open the bite the least amount necessary to accomplish your aesthetic and functional goals. That's all. And that's what I tell the laboratory. Don't open it any more than you have to. If that's a millimeter in the back, fine. If it's two, that's okay. But whatever it takes, but don't say I need a 19 millimeters from CJ to CJ of the central incisor, the upper and lower central incisor, because somebody said the Shimbiashi message says that's what you need. And then you end up opening two when one would have accomplished our aesthetic and functional goals. So that's the reason we do it. We don't do a predetermined amount. We do the least amount necessary is what I tell them. So our sequence was hygiene. It wasn't bad, but we always, cases like this, we're going to run them through hygiene first. Then I get our diagnostic, just like you saw with Keith, but it's a different type of case. Uh, after we get our wax up back, we can go right into restorative. So let's talk a little bit about attrition, uh, grinding teeth. So with attrition, you're going to see that where facets match, you're going to see where is located in areas of occlusal contact, usually meaning cusp tips and incisal edges, where facets have sharp edges, you're going to see that, especially in vertical wear on lower incisors, which that third slide is a case of vertical wear. The first two are horizontal wear. That's a vertical wear case. And you can see the sharp edges and where of enamel and dentin is even. This is something you don't see in erosion. Erosion, you're going to see the acid will wear dentin faster than enamel. So when dentin is exposed, acid erosion will wear dentin. And you'll see the cupping with erosion that you won't see with attrition. You'll see when people grind their teeth, they wear the enamel and dentin even, and they don't wear restorations. So you won't see anywhere on a grinder, you'll see, uh, you'll see shiny spots, but you won't see wear. And in erosion, you'll see no effect on restorations, but you'll see effect on the tooth around the restoration. So as I said, the two types of wear are horizontal, and you're gonna see vertical. Kois called the horizontal bruxers cows because they, they, they grind in, in broad, you know, horizontal motions like a cow. He called the vertical bruxers rats because they just chew straight up and down. Vertical bruxers are easier to restore because usually the wear is not caused by people grinding as much as it's caused by teeth that are in the way, usually because of their occlusal scheme or whatever. So often with vertical wear, it's just a matter of giving them room and giving them room to, and the great thing about vertical wear, the reason I love to open bites in people with, with, uh, with, that don't have room to restore in vertical wear, because when you open a bite, the jaw comes slightly down and back. And what that does is it decreases overbite, increases over jet. And that's exactly what you want to do in vertical wear because they have excessive overbite and they have no over jet. So you want to de you want to increase over jet and you want to decrease overbite. And that's what happens when you open a bite. So that's why they respond, vertical wear responds really well to opening bites, the, the rat biters. So the three grinding patterns of horizontal wear, we're going to see protrusive, incisal edges are flat and even, lateral without crossover can be right, left, or both, and centrals are usually shorter on the distal, and lateral with crossover, you're going to see the centrals are shorter on the mesial. Okay, so these are the three patterns. So here's protrusive, incisal edges flat and even, here's lateral without crossover, the, the centrals are shorter on the distal, and lateral with crossover, you're going to see the centrals are shorter on the mesial. You're going to see notching of incisal edges as opposed to a protrusive bruxer where they're flat and even, like Dave. Dave was a protrusive bruxer. How do we know his incisal edges were flat and even? The characteristics, wear facets cross incisal edges and cuss tips with horizontal wear. So this is what Dave was a horizontal wear. So you're going to see that incisal edges are crossing on uh, incisal edges and cuss tips. Tooth link is redu reduced. Overbite is reduced or eliminated in horizontal wear cases 
and capitular eruption is common. The problem with this is when teeth wear, they move and it creates all these imbalances in your bite and it creates a uh, occlusal plane disharmony. You're gonna have two plane occlusions and all kinds of things from, from compensatory eruption. Compensatory eruption, which we'll see a little bit later in another case, it also, when teeth slowly erupt through, through uh, compensatory eruption, it causes gum and bone to come with the tooth. And that causes gingival uh, disharmony as well as occlusal disharmony. So all kinds of problems happen in wear cases that we see. And that's what makes them a little bit more difficult to treat. So our goals of treatment in horizontal wear, we want to design occlusion that fits the grinding patterns of the patient. So we want to minimize overbite when we can without affecting aesthetics too much. We want to shell out the guides. And sometimes, and Frank Spear is a proponent of this, is a group function. Sometimes you want to share the load. If you put somebody in canine guides and you know they're going to grind laterally, all the force is going to be on that canine. We know that sometimes if a, if an, uh, a canine position is restored with an implant, we're, we're going to use group function there. We don't always use canine guides. Or if we have a premolar that's, uh, that's migrated into canine position, we're not going to go straight canine guidance there on a premolar or a tooth like sometimes we're gonna use a modified group function. And that's what, what we think, or people like Frank Spear teach that sometimes in these uh, horizontal wear cases, it can be advantageous to incorporate some group function, especially in a protrusive bruxure. Uh, specifically, you would do something like, you, you have the mesial of the mandibular premolar contact the, the distal of the maxillary canine, the, the distal half of the maxillary canine, and that'll share some of that load so all the load isn't just on the centrals or on the laterals. Those two teeth can pick up some of that uh, when, the, when the patient slides forward and all the load isn't being placed too much or too much excessive load on just a couple of restorations or teeth. So again, just like with Keith, the same thing we see with Dave. Here's Dave right here. Here's his case. We want to improve aesthetics. Absolutely. He's not happy with his appearance and he's a bank executive. So his appearance is important to him. We want to improve occlusal relationships. We've already talked about that and we need space. We want to make his teeth longer so he'll look better. I got no room to make these teeth any longer. So I need, I need room for restorations. Same criteria. Exactly. We don't, we don't ever alter from this. We don't ever deviate from this. We do it the same way every time. And then we're able to, just like we showed you before, with all that diagnostic wax up criteria, here's the laboratory's wax up. They give us a beautiful functional wax up. And now we want to create a stable occlusion. And that citric stops at all teeth when possible, no posterior contact and excursive movements. We want anterior guidance and harmony with the envelope of function. That means the way the patient wants to chew. And we want condyles to work from an orthopedically stable position, central relation, just like what Pete Dawson said, when signs of, of instability exist and you know, you're, you've got good uh, joints and no muscle pain, central relation is our, is our restorative position. So here's Dave with this, uh, we used it, we made, oh, by the way, we make the provisionals exactly the same way. We could have done a mock-up, we could have done an APT because we had our putty matrix, we could have done an APP on, on an APT on Dave, our, our, our pre-operatory mock-up, I mean, our pre-restorative mock-up, we could have done that to evaluate and, and visualize the end result before we ever start, do our depth cuts if we want. And then after preparation and after bites and impressions and everything, we use those the same putty matrix to make our provisionals. And then we get the patient back after a couple of days for our post-op check, just like you saw earlier. We go through our all of our things, our three Fs with our post-op check. And then after that, the laboratory takes the model work and you can see where the bridges are. We did two bridges. Uh, patient already has some lower implants, uh, some lower molar implants, and they're gonna, he's gonna eventually have some maxillary implants. Maybe for sure on the upper right, we don't know about the upper left, uh, but for sure the, the, the case was a uh, treatment plan to do, uh, eventually do two implants on the upper right. And here he is post-op after he comes back. Here was before and after, before and after, before and after. The big thing with him, I feel like, is remember that look, that expression of being tired, the eyes are tired, the face looks tired to now. So, you know, being able to give them something like that, it's a more comfortable position. Opening his bite, I think, actually made him a little bit more comfortable. Certainly it gave us room to give him, you know, some aesthetic restorations, but it also, I think, made him more comfortable because now, you know, 
you know, he had room to move around a little bit more. He had a little bit more freedom and he knows he looks a lot better too. And as a bank executive, you know, that was important to him. So we're moving on now to the dark tooth. So this is Ken. So Ken comes in for a consult. The interesting thing about this is we, you know, we always meet um, when a patient comes in for a consult, you know, we meet with them first, you know, in, in a consultation room, not in an operatory. And it's, it's a, usually a kind of a, you know, it's, it's set up to be low key to where, you know, it's softer lighting, you know, we have stuff on the walls to make them think we know stuff, even if we maybe don't, but we try to make it look like we know what we're doing, you know, so they can see stuff on the walls or maybe before and after book or something like that, you know, offer them something to drink. We do, we're just trying to get to know them a little bit. Well, the room, like I said, the lighting is kind of low in there. I come in, I introduce myself, sit down across the table from him and he smiles and I think he's missing the tooth. That's how dark it is. And with low lighting, I honestly, for a minute, I thought number eight was missing. The tooth was that dark. So we're going to go ahead and you can see he's had endo. He's got a temporary filling. The temporary filling has been in there for so long that the tooth is, has gotten darker and darker because the temporary filling is leaking. So it's caused his tooth to get extremely dark. The other thing is, is his anterior teeth are extremely thin because he has acid erosion on his eight anterior teeth. And acid erosion has caused him to have an open bite and a reverse smile arc and it's caused these teeth to be extremely thin. It's literally the lingual surfaces look like they've been prepped. That's how significant the acid erosion was. So we're not only now having to deal with a dark tooth and we're having to try to lighten that dark tooth and match it, but we're also, you know, as, as part of our consultation, we recommended when, when we explained about the acid erosion and we explained about the long-term detriment of, of that not having it treated, you know, he, he understood that and he wanted to do something about it as well. This was a little bit advantageous for us because if his teeth were that color, which was his teeth were a great color and they were perfectly healthy and I was having to match that tooth to, to natural teeth, it would have been a little more difficult than matching it to a restoration. Now, it still isn't easy to match a really dark tooth when you're matching one restoration to another restoration but it was, it did help us a little bit. In fact, that we were gonna be doing restorations on his other teeth. So our diagnosis was the dark endodontically treated central and he had intrinsic acid erosion. In extrinsic is anything acid ingested and you'll usually see the wear on the facial surfaces. Intrinsic is regurgitated stomach acids and you're usually gonna see that on the lingual surfaces. That's why we call this intrinsic acid erosion because the lingual surfaces of the maxillary teeth were worn. So our goals are to lighten the dark tooth. That's what he was in for. That was his chief and his only complaint. Really, he wasn't even aware that he had the acid erosion. We want to restore the worn incisors. We want to, he's got this little anterior open bite, which is great because the lingles are already prepped. The last thing I want to do is prep any more off those teeth. So I got tons of room to put restorative material on the lingles of these anterior teeth because I want to uh, bring his teeth down a little bit anyway. And I have, I have room to restore those teeth. And we want to correct his reverse smile arc just to prove overall setting, you know, there was really thin incised ledges chipping and wear. Our plan were we're going to do 360 degree veneers. So in other words, wrap around veneers on all the teeth except tooth number eight. And that tooth is going to basically get a crown. And so we're going to crown that tooth. And we, we treated this tooth. We tried everything we could to lighten this tooth. Basically, we, we internally bleached the tooth for a couple of weeks to try to get it lighter. And then we put the lightest composite, this ultra light composite inside the tooth. And then we put a little layer of composite over the outside of the tooth and, it, and an ND8 was the light, as light as we could get the tooth, which you'll see in a minute. But what we decided was at the time we did this, remember today we have zirconia, translucent zirconia, that's a beautiful restoration. We, it, but it's so trans, it's so aesthetic now but it, I don't know if I would really feel comfortable e even with zirconia using a translucent zirconia to block out a really dark tooth. But a regular zirconia, a, a, a more opaque zirconia coping layered with a more aesthetic ceramic, that allows us to do two things. One, it allows us to block out the darker tooth, but the layering ceramic allows us to match to the other aesthetic restorations he had on his other teeth. And that's what we decided to do in our treatment plan. And because his tissue was so healthy, he was ready to start right into restorative.
And so that's what we did. So our character, unlike attrition, characteristics of erosion are a little bit different. You're going to see where it could be anywhere the acid hits. It doesn't have to be in areas of occlusal contact. It could be anywhere the acid hits the teeth. So it, like you see here, it could be on facial surfaces. It could be on lingual surfaces. It could be on occlusal surfaces. It could be anywhere. So where facets are not sharp and shiny, they're dull with dentinous cupped and rounded. And you can see that acid will erode to structure, but it will not affect restorations. So composite works well in acid erosion case, especially if you catch it early. We do a lot of we do a lot of these uh, occlusals where you see the little cratering in the occlusal surfaces because of acid erosion. We fill those in with flowable composites, and they do great. They do really really well. In fact, this, the slide in the middle right here, if this were if we weren't doing full arch restorations because we were opening the bite for room, I could put a little composite. If everything else was okay, you could fill a little composite right there. And acid erosion cases do well. They do really well. So our material options in this case were, there's two types of restorations. You got monolithic and you have layered. Those are our two types of restorations. In a monolithic restorations, you have feldspathic, the powder liquid glass ceramics. You have lucite reinforced, which is uh, most commonly uh, in this family of glass ceramics is Empress. Everybody's heard of Empress at the time. I still do some cases in Empress today, but the most popular of the monolithic glass ceramics are the lithium to silicate. Can they either be pressed or milled? The first one out is was called Emax, Emax lithium to silicate or Emax press or Emax CAD. And the CAD was the millable, the press was the press ceramic. Uh, there's a lot of, because Ivoclar had a patent, they were the only ones for a while and they had great success with this restorative material and, uh, and their Emax system. Uh, now the, the patent has run out and other companies have of uh, both lithium silicate and lithium disilicate. Uh, GC has a really uh, neat one out now called Lisi Press and, and uh, they're coming out with a CAD version too. Uh, so there's some other ones out there. It's just that it's hard to compete when somebody like Ivoclar, as good as their product was, has been out for a long time, but it is a great restorative material because it's, it's aesthetic and it's strong. It's much stronger. You can see 400 megapascals compared to say like 120 to 140. You know, it's a lot stronger than, and, and certainly than, than either Empress or Feldspathic glasses. And then the other monolithic restoration are the solid crystallines. Now, the newer zirconias, the, the original zirconias, the ones that were a thousand or so megapascals, they were extremely strong, great for posterior teeth, but not something you really want to use for an aesthetic restoration. Now, the game has changed. Now, zirconia sacrificed strength by making it more translucent. So they added yttria to their zirconia. And as they add yttria, the material becomes more translucent, but it also becomes weaker. But there are, you could do beautiful restorations with zirconia, absolutely stunningly beautiful restorations with solid zirconia. The, the drawback to me, you can bond zirconia, but I still think because you can etch glass, you can't etch zirconia, you have to bond zirconia with a primer, with a metal primer. With glass, you can etch it for increase and silenate it with a silane primer. So you get a double benefit, I think, of retention. And I like glass a little bit better uh, simply uh, because it's strong enough anteriorly and it's very aesthetic too, but it's that, you know, it's that etchability. Unless I have a very retentive prep, then I have no problem using uh, uh, anterior zirconia. So uh, for the translucent zirconia. Layered, you can fuse it, zircon, you can fuse porcelain to zirconia or metal. Uh, Porcelain and metal restorations are, as, as um, you know, Gordon Christian says, is kind of like a dinosaur. It's a, you just don't see much of them anymore, especially in the high noble restorations, the gold restorations. Uh, they're expensive, uh, they're time consuming, they're labor intensive, uh, and uh, you know, you can get a great looking mill restoration for a whole lot less now. And so it just doesn't seem economically feasible or, or wise to do. But there are a few times that I, I want a layered core restoration. In this case of, of Ken's was one of them. So I still do porcelain to zirconia, not as much as I used to, much rarer now, but I'll, I'll, I'll list here in just a minute where, where those, what those clinical situations are where we still do uh, layered uh, zirconia. It's fairly rare, but we still do it as we did in Ken's case. So even though Ken's case was a while ago, it was probably, I don't know, seven, eight, 10 years ago, I, I still would probably do it the same way today because we got a good result. So this is a monolithic restoration. This is a porcelain veneer. It can be done in any of those glass ceramics. It could be done in zirconia too. I just wouldn't recommend it because of the bond strengths. Here's a porcelain crown. It's much thicker, 
but it's all one material. So it's monolithic. Here's a crown that's the same thickness, but it's layered because you can see there's this thin little uh, zirconia core, and then there's your veneering ceramic over it. So this is the restoration we decided to do for Ken because we felt like it gave us our best chance of blocking out. And so here's Ken's, uh, this is an example we're saying, the lightest we could get his tooth was an ND8 and his other teeth or ND1, which is the lightest shade on the, on the uh, foundation shade guide. So where are those situations where we're gonna use layered? Uh, well, when a, when a tooth color is dark, like the case we're showing right now, but how about if you have a metal post and core and you don't wanna risk trying to get it out? The great way to do it. Or if somebody has a titanium abutment that's already been placed, or they had fractured their zirconia abutment and the, you know, my periodontist told them doesn't like zirconia abutments. Uh, she's had a couple break and, you know, she likes doing, you know, gold or titanium abutments. And sometimes it, you know, it's better for the patient long-term. Well, we can cover those really nice with layered zirconia restorations there and can get a really, really nice aesthetic result. And we can do anterior bridges with Emacs. But the manufacturers does not recommend anything over three units. And you'd really like about 16 square millimeters of connector site. So with zirconia, you can do longer span bridges and you can do multiponic bridges. So, I mean, if I were, you know, doing an, an anterior bridge that was longer than three units or more than one ponic, you know, that's where I might want to, and I'm looking for maximum aesthetics in an anterior bridge, uh, I might look at, that's where I would consider lay, layered zirconia. So let's talk about how we're going to bond this in now. So we're going to submit his, his restorations and we'll talk real quickly. I just want to touch on some bonding agents and some cements. So if you're etching to all or mostly all enamel, you would like to use total etch because you get higher bonds when you're bonding to enamel with total etch. If you've got some enamel and some dentin, you're going to get good bond to enamel with, your, with, a, with an acid etch and you're going to get good bond to dentin with a self etch. So this is what we call the selective etch technique where we put our, our acid etch gel just on the enamel and then we use a self-etching primer to prime the dentin. And then if you have all or mostly all dentin, you really don't need acid etching because we get great bond strengths to dentin with self-etching primers. So we'd use a self-etch technique. So if we want to use total etch, selective etch or self-etch and we want to use it at different times because different clinical scenarios the great thing about today is we're able to do that with one adhesive. So in the, the first generation that was really effective is what we call the fourth generation, the three steps, the three steps where you'd etch and rinse, you'd put your primer on, you'd evaporate the solvent, then you'd come back with a, with a third step, which was your adhesive layer. Then they combined the primer and the bond into one and they called it prime and bond. So you would do two steps there and that's called that the fifth generation. Then because of different reasons, but primarily because of sensitivity, uh, it, it, because of uh, you know protocols not being followed rigidly and things like that, a lot of uh, micro leakage, post-op sensitivity and things, they eliminated the etching step and used acidic primers to etch and prime and bond. And that was the first generation was a six. And this was a self-etch technique where the etched was done with the primers. And then a second step with this, the, the adhesive layer. Then after that, they said, well, it worked if we, when they, in the fourth to the fifth generation, they just combined the primer and the bond into one bottle and it worked and it did. But when they tried to do it with self-etching, it didn't. The chemistries just didn't work. So it's the seventh generation self-etcher single bottles are not, there's, there's really no use, reason to use that. And primarily because they didn't work and they failed in a lot of cases and they were very susceptible to hydrolysis and bond degradation, okay? So, and they weren't compatible with self-cure or dual-cure resins so at all, zero compatibility. So because of that, there's really no reason to ever even think about using them because we do have single bottles now in what we call the eighth generation or the universal adhesives. And the great thing about universal adhesives, what I love so much is that it doesn't matter if you're using total etch, selective or self etch, it doesn't matter. So if you're using a fourth, fifth or sixth generation, you have to have multiple inventory. But if you're using a universal adhesive in any of those clinical situations, you only need a single bottle. You only need one adhesive the universal adhesive and that's why i like them so much they combine etching priming bonding in one bottle you can be used with total etch self etch or selective etch techniques they can be used for direct or indirect restorations they have a low film thickness so you can cure them you have to cure them 
before you see the restoration. They don't, they go on hydrophilic and they don't become hydrophobic to bond to a restoration until they're like cured. So it's critical that you like cure them before you see the restoration, but they have a film thickness of less than 10 microns. So they won't interfere with the seed of a restoration. They don't pull in corners or anything like that when you evaporate the solvent. And they are compatible with light cure and dual cure and self cures. And if not, your manufacturer will say so, and you might have to use a dual cure activator. But one of the reasons why I started using all bond universal so early because it was one of the first two out of, of, of excuse me, <laughs> I'm sorry, 3M. I knew it would come to me. 3M was the first out with universal adhesive. And, uh, it, and then uh, all bond universal came out right after that. But with 3M, you'd need a dual cure activator if you didn't use it with their cement. But with Albon Universal, you could use anybody's uh, cements or anybody's composites, and you didn't have to need it. You didn't need a dual cure activator. So I started using it early, and now there's 10 or 12, maybe more companies now, and they all have great universal adhesives. And uh, Scotch Bond Universal is what I was trying to think of. Uh, 3M was the first one. It's a great product. There's all, there's so many choices now, but just be sure you read the manufacturer's instructions so you use them properly. But uh, I've had great success with Albon Universal and I really like it. As far as cements, like I said at the beginning, there's conventional cementation. And what I mean by that is you don't treat the tooth or the restoration. You just clean off the tooth, you rinse, you dry, lightly dry, whatever. You put the cement in the, in the restoration, you put the restoration on the tooth and clean off the excess. That's it. It's simple, it's easy, it's fast, and everybody likes doing that when you have retentive preparations. And why not? It's just easier to do with less, you know, less steps, less sensitivity, less problems to worry about, less isolation to worry about, all those things. But then there's adhesive resin cementation. Okay, this involves a resin cement, and this does involve treating the tooth and treating the restoration. Restorations, whether they're glass or, or zirconia, need to be treated with primers. Need to be too, and when it's glass, it needs to be etched and it needs to be primed. If it's if it's a zirconia and you're bonding it with an adhesive resin cementation, it needs to be primed with a zirconia primer. And the tooth needs to be treated. It needs to be isolated. It needs to be treated. If it's all or mostly all dent, it's less isolation is necessary because you don't. You can use it self etching primers or you can use a universal adhesive in self etching priming mode. You don't put acid etch on the tooth. But if you're if you're bonding something like a veneer where you need really you, you want to bond for strength and for retention or to non-retentive prep you might want to and you might need extra retention then you are isolating anytime i use acid etch i'm going to isolate so in ken's case we're going to etch his teeth because he has a lot of enamel present we're going to be etching so we're going to be using an adhesive resin cementation but if i'm putting a crown on a posterior tooth you know, a lot of times I'm just going to cement that, especially zirconia crowns with conventional cementation. And a lot of these new cements, like their sim I was talking about at the beginning, uh, they have an affinity. They they incorporate the MDP, mon MDP monomer into the cement, which has a strong affinity for zirconia. So you're going to get some bond to zirconia simply by using cements like that. So conventional cementation uh, you know, for years, these cements worked well, but they're water soluble and margins wash out, wash out and leak, even with glass armors, which are great cements because they release fluoride. But we have better cements now with better physical properties because they combine resin with glass armors. And now you have fluoride release, but you have a resin modified glass armor. Again, conventional cementation, you don't treat the tooth, you don't treat the restoration, but they're simple and easy to use. You get some fluoride release and fluoride ion release, which is beneficial. And you get a simple and easy to use restoration I mean, and cement and a restoration that's easy to clean up. And then they took a step further, manufacturers took a step further and they, they, they took the resin cements and advanced them to what they call the self adhesive resin cements. That's where you could put a resin cement into a restoration where you didn't need to treat the tooth or the restoration. You could bond a tooth by getting some adhesion to the restoration and some adhesion to the tooth, but it's limited restoration. Now it's simple and easy to use with a self adhesive resin cement. But remember, you should use this with retentive preparations because the amount of adhesion, the self adhesion you get to a tooth and to the restoration is gonna be minimal compared to if you use primers on restorations in teeth and, and uh, which we would get in adhesive uh, resin cementation. But they can be used and they're simple and easy to use. And a new category are what I call these ion releasing cements. 
And uh, Sermer uh, Doxas was one of the first ones here. Uh, it's, a, it's just a strictly self-care cement. It has no resin component, unlike Activa and Therosim have a resin component. So they're self-adhesive resin cements. And Activa, as I said earlier, it releases not just fluoride, not just calcium, but also phosphate ions. Therosim releases both uh, calcium and fluoride. So there could be some benefit to these cements because again, they're simple and easy to use. They have some bond to tooth, some bond to restoration, and they might be, you know, combating certain things like, uh, uh, you know, marginal integrity, you know, breakdown, things like that. Uh, there, there's been some studies have shown uh, they might uh, contribute to hydroxyapatite formation. We do know that they have an elevated pH, uh, pH sometimes of eight or a little over eight, which is bactericidal or and, 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 and can be beneficial. It's very kind. It's very easy to the pulp, and it also helps. Uh, with uh, intraoral acidity too, it acts it, it acts to buffer acids, which can be can be beneficial. So there could be a lot of beneficial uh, elements to these cements, and it's a category I think that's worth looking into. Uh, and and again, uh, Activa is they're able to call their cement bioactive cement because they do have FDA approval to say that uh, on the uh, pulp is Activa. I just wanted to be clear on that. So adhesive resin cementation, are, there are two types of resin cements. You have the dual cure resin cements uh, like dual link and, and link force are great, a couple of great. And then you have the light cure. Now dual cure will set two ways. One, it has a self cure component. So it will cure in the dark without any light polymerization, but it can be also further cured with light polymerization. It's used mainly if you're, if you're worried that because of the thickness of restoration or, or where it is in the mouth, if the light won't penetrate and cure the entire uh, resin component, dual cure, res dual cure resins are, are recommended in, in situations like that. And anterior restorations that are thinner, like a porcelain veneer, there's no need to use a dual cure because a light cure res uh, resin will give you a, a longer working time and it will also give you, you know, an opportunity to cure through the restoration and cure the cement entirely. Um, I like uh, Zest Accolade PV. I think this is a great cement. I think we use this in Ken's case. I think we used Accolade in that case and Pulp Dense Clear Veneer. If you want a veneer that will not affect the shade of your restoration, what's if you have a really thin, if you got a great tooth color and you got a really thin translucent restoration and you want a really clear cement, uh, Pulp Dense Clear Veneer will, will certainly satisfy that requirement. And then you have some companies that have come out with, with a little box where you have both light cure and dual cure in there. Uh, Verilink Aesthetic, the LCs for light cure, the DCs for dual cure, and the e-cement kit by Bisco has both a light cure and a dual cure component. So these are what we would do adhesive resin cementation with. This is Ken's model work. These are the wraparound veneers. And then this crown. There's the restorations. These are Emacs restorations on everything but number eight, and that's a, a zirconia, a layered zirconia restoration on tooth number eight. So we've isolated with the rubber dam because we're gonna etch these teeth. So we etch, we put our universal adhesive, we evaporate the solvent, we light cure. I go ahead and put the cement directly on the teeth and then I seek the restorations. I just find it's easier that way. We seed all eight ester restorations. We used a lighter cement for number eight and we used a dual cure cement for number eight because we wanted, uh, we wanted as light a cement as possible uh, to try to affect the, uh, you know, if there was some show through. We didn't expect there to be through a layered zirconia restoration, but just in case there was, we wanted to hedge everything we could. We wipe away all the excess. Uh, we seed all, all the restorations, all eight restorations. We, we clean off the excess. We're gonna go ahead and tack, the, tack at the gingival margin so that we can come back and floss the contacts. So if we tack them, they won't move while we floss. And now we've cleaned up. So we can take cotton rolls and brushes and we can clean off all the excess except interproximally. And the way we do that is after we tack, we just floss. And now we've got all the excess, we can come back and light cure. So that's how we seed our restorations. And that's using our, our universal adhesive and our light cure cement. And here's the post-op, here he is with the, uh, it's a pretty good match, it's not perfect, but considering how dark it was when it started, we got a pretty good match and we were able to close in the open bite a little bit. We got the reverse smile curve. We were able to correct that. 
have a nicer looking smile and, and, and really a pretty close match from, from tooth number eight to the restoration, restoration, rest of the restorations. Get a little tongue tied there. I thought I'd mention really quickly another technique to use uh, when we're talking about trying to block out color. Uh, and maybe we're going to use a restoration here where we weren't able to use zirconia, but we had tetracycline stain. And I'm not going to use it. I'm not going to prep this for a crown because we're trying to be as minimally invasive as we can. But it's dark. And the worst place you can have tetracycline stain is in the gingival third because that's where the restoration needs to be the thinnest. So what we did here is we just we prepped, we do our ideal prep, and then we prep a little bit more away, and I come back with a composite. And I'm just going to bond some composite right onto the gingival third. And so we can bond that in there to lighten up the shade. And so now we've created, so you can see the right to the left. So the right we haven't done yet, the left. So you can see how we've improved the shade of the teeth. And we go ahead and we lighten up all those teeth. And we could take something that was like an ND7 or 8, and we can move it all the way up to an ND2. And now it's so much easier for the laboratory because they can use a, they don't have to worry about uh, opaquing a restoration or using a more opaque material. They can use a more translucent material that, you know, will be more aesthetic because it's more translucent because we've lightened up the tooth color. So that's just another way if you encounter this sometimes where you have a, a, a dark gingival third for whatever reason, you can sometimes mash that out with a thin little layer of composite. This is a a, a microhybrid composite, probably like an A1 shade or something like that. So moving on to the next case. So this is our excessive gingival display. We're looking at, we're going to look at two cases here because there are two different types of cases. Uh, one case uh, we're going to treat one way, uh, Bailey's case, and the Laura's case we're going to treat a different way. And there's a specific reason why we treated two gummy smiles different ways and I'm going to go ahead and, and try to explain that as we as we get into it. So Bailey's chief complaint is she doesn't like her teeth. She thinks her teeth are dark. She didn't complain as much about the gumminess as I thought she would because when we recommended the periodontist, she wasn't really set sold on it until I told her that I wouldn't do veneers because she would they wouldn't be pretty without doing the doing the period procedure first getting a little bit ahead of myself, but I just want you to know that wasn't really her chief complaint, the gumminess. The chief complaint, I think, was the size of the teeth and the color of the teeth. She wanted whiter, brighter teeth, and she had short teeth, but she had short teeth because the gums were covering up some of her teeth. So Bailey had short teeth and a gummy smile, but we diagnosed Bailey's condition as altered passive eruption, which we'll talk about in a minute. That's where the gum doesn't recede to the CEJ. So some of the clinical crown is actually being covered by gum tissue. And that's why the teeth look short and the gum is a smile. And you say, well, well, how do you know that? Well, we just look at the, first off, I, first thing I do in a case like this, is I have them, uh, we look at lip at rest and I look at the size ledge position. So when Bailey, she's showing at least three millimeters, maybe more. So I say to myself, well, her incised ledge position is good. Then I look at the incised ledges, I see no wear. So she has no wear, so she has no compensatory eruption. And so I'm thinking to myself, her incised ledge position is good. That must mean that her teeth need to be longer gingerly. That's, that's kind of our thought process there. So we diagnose altered passive eruption. In Laura's case, we look at her teeth, she's got short teeth and a gummy smile. But I look at her teeth and I see worn incisal edges. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, these, said, these teeth are short because she's worn the teeth down, but the teeth have worn to stay in occlusion. So they've erupted. And that's what we're talking about when, capitular, when you have wear with capitular eruption is the teeth erupt slowly, they bring the bone and the gum down with them. So the reason Laura's smile is gummy is because the gum has been brought down and that's created a gummy smile. And Laura was concerned about the gummy. She was concerned about the wear, the shortness of her teeth because of the wear. She knew she had wear, but she was also concerned about the gumminess of her smile. And I was worried about it too because I wasn't even sure that with our treatment option or what we chose for her, which we'll get into in just a minute, that it would still be enough. It turned out okay, but I'll, I'll tell you, when we get into her case, I'll tell you what I'm talking about. I'm getting, again, I'm sorry, I apologize. I'm getting a little ahead of myself there, but a thought pops into my head and I just say it without even thinking. But I'll, I'll tell you what I was talking about. In addition to just what we did with her, there's something else that can be done 
in these cases because sometimes the gumminess is not just because the gums have come down because it can be hypermobility of the lip. That's what I'm getting at, but I'll come back to that in just a minute if it is lip hypermobility. So here we look at Bailey. So Bailey's diagnosis will alter passive eruption. Our treatment goals were we want to decrease gingival display, get rid of the gummy smile. We want to increase in size. We, the teeth, they're too short. They need to be longer. But we want to maintain her incisal edge position because we've already determined by lip at rest that her incisal edge is in a good position. So we want a wider, brighter smile. So if her incisal edge is good and her teeth are short and she's gummy, then I know I want longer teeth. Well, if I raise her gums, we're going to get longer teeth and decreased gums. So we're going to get two good things out of that. Two things that we want. We want to decrease gums. We want to increase length. Well, just raise the gums then. That's how we came up with our treatment plan. So our treatment plan for her was crown lengthening. And the reason is, the reason we want to raise her gums is because the gums are covering up clinical crown. And so if we raise the gums, we're going to expose the entire clinical crown of the tooth. So it's going to decrease gumminess. It's going to increase tooth length while maintaining existing size ledge position. So basically, I explained all this to her and I showed her a couple of cases. And, you know, she was willing to meet with a periodontist. And after the periodontist explained what he wanted to do, she agreed to do the crown lengthening. Then afterwards, after the healing process, we, we told her we would do 10 veneers on 4 through 13. So our sequence was periodontist followed by restorative. In Laura's case, because of the wear, the, the, and she was a, a protrusive bruxer too, and size ledges are flat and even. So our treatment goals were that we didn't want to do crown. Can you do crown lengthening? Well, yeah, you could decrease gumminess and you could increase length of tooth if you raised her gums, the problem with doing crown lengthening is, is that her gingival margin, unlike Bailey, is at the CEJ. So if I raise her gum, or if the periodontist does crown lengthening, where's it? What's he going to expose? He's going to expose root. And not only is that more difficult to bond to, but it's also narrower. So you're going to have a really narrow gingival third of any restoration. So it's two, it creates two problems there, two things that we wanted to avoid if we could. And so that's why we elected not to do crown lengthening. What we wanted to do is intrude the teeth. So we push the teeth up and push the gum. So if you intrude the teeth slowly orthodontically, you can actually push the gums back up. And that's what we wanted to do. So we wanted, ex our treatment goals were exactly the same for Laura as they were for, for Bailey. Decreased gingival display, increase in size or length, have the same, we want her in size ledge position or final size as in size ledge position to be where it is right now. And she wants a wider, brighter smile. So the goals are the same. Our treatment plan was, unlike Bailey, we're going to do orthodontic intrusion to decrease the gingival display. I apologize. Somebody's starting a car in the parking lot. <laughs> okay. Porcelain veneers on T through 413 to increase in size of length, reestablish ideal in size ledge position, and to create a wider, brighter smile. So that's what we're gonna do with veneers after she's through with ortho. So both of these patients are gonna to have to, you know, go through treatment first. In Bailey's case, it was about eight weeks of healing time. In Laura's case, it was a little bit longer. It takes a little bit longer. I think it was like nine months, I think she had to go through the intrusion process. So she's gonna see the orthodontics and then restorative. So Bailey's seeing the periodontist to crown length, and Laura's gonna see the orthodontist for intrusion. So we talk about gummy smiles. We talk about it. what are the causes of gummy smiles? Well, there can be a lot of different causes. It could be short philtrum height. You could have a hypermobile lip. I talked about hypermobility of lip a minute ago. Sometimes the teeth are, are right. The teeth are normal. You still have a gummy smile. You can have a normal length tooth and an incised ledge position that's correct and no uh, excessive gingiva, but just a, a hypermobile lip. Uh, vertical maxillary excess, you have too much uh, maxillary bone. Uh, again, you're going to see the same thing, a normal incisal edge, no wear, and size of the position is right, length of central is right, all these things are right, and the smile is still gummy. That most likely is going to be because of uh, vertical maxillary excess. These are usually surgical considerations. Altered pass eruption, like with Bailey, compensatory eruption, like with Laura, and uh, dictavial, anterior dictavial extrusion. We see this often sometimes with uh, class two deep bite cases, things like that. But these are the altered pass eruption and compensatory eruption are things that we can treat. And, and it just so happens we are in these two cases. So whenever you deal with, with tissue, especially if you're gonna raise tissue, you need to talk about biologic width. So when we talk about the biologic width, the biologic width is just the tissue 
attachment apparatus, and it has two components. The first component at the bottom of the sub, from the bottom of the sulcus, starting at the bottom of the sulcus, is the epithelial tissue attachment. Okay, on average, it's about one millimeter, and then. The, you have the supercrestal connective tissue attachment that goes from the epithelial attachment to the osseous crest. And on average, that's about one millimeter. So these two components combined add up to about two millimeters. Now, when we're measuring for purposes of restoration, we take that biologic width of about two millimeters on average, it can vary granted, but on average it's about two and we add a average normal sulcus depth of about a millimeter. So if you add a millimeter for sulcus depth for an average healthy sulcus to the two millimeters biologic width, you come up with three millimeters or what COIS called the biologic zone. Now, the reason this is important for us in, in restorative dentistry is because almost 99% are of our anterior restorations now, well, maybe not that high, but a very high percentage of our anterior restorations are placed equigingival. They're not placed subgingival anymore because we don't have to hide the margins beneath the gum line. So because they're placed equigingival, we need to know from the gingival margin, the free gingival margin to the osseous crest, how much room that is. And on average, it needs to be three millimeters. And that's what my periodontist knows to do crown lengthening. So if I tell my periodontist, I, and it, this is a, a schematic here of what Coy's called the biologic zone. It's just adding the sulcus depth to the biologic width is the, gives us three millimeters of biologic zone. So if my, if my periodontist is going to do crown lengthening, all he needs to know is incisal edge position and length of central, those two things. And the rest of it is his own measurements. So what do we see in ultrapass eruption? We're gonna see short clinical crown, excessive gingival display, and no incisal wear. And sometimes for some reason, the tissue doesn't recede to the CEJ. And if you see the white line here, here's the CEJ, the yellow line is the bone but we have our three millimeters there, but we still have tissue covering the tooth. Well, if you have three millimeters here, I could just come in here with a laser or anything and just remove that tissue right there. And it's gonna stay because it's got three millimeters. So sometimes it's just a gingivectomy. And in some cases of alter pass eruption, it's like that. In Bailey's case, it wasn't. Her CEJ was very close to the bone and that's why the gum was covering up the tooth. So in cases like that, it's different. So here's Bailey. So here we see the CJ, the white line. Here we see the bone, the yellow line. And here we see our three millimeters. Well, if we go in and we do a gingivectomy to the white line, yes, we're going to have an 11 millimeter central, but that tissue is going to grow right back down unless we move the bone up two millimeters. And that's what the periodontist does with crown lengthening. And that's what he did with Bailey because that was her situation. So you come in, you measure nine millimeters. We, I tell him, incisal edge position is good and I need an 11 millimeter central. So he says, fine. So he goes ahead, he measures 11 millimeter and he makes his cut. Then he comes back and he does free gingival margins irrespective of where the bone is. The bone doesn't matter right now. He wants to make I ideal gingival height symmetry. And that's what he creates for all 10 teeth. Then he reflects his flap. Now he measures, he adds three millimeters to the link, clinical length of the crown. And you notice that when you do that cut, that's tooth structure. That's how, that's enamel that's being exposed right there. That's not root structure, okay? Like we would see if they did, did this for Laura. So this is healthy tooth that we're gonna get it, be able to get a good margin on and we're gonna be able to bond very effectively to. So now he adds three to 11 and he comes up with 14 and that's where the bone needs to be. So he measures 14 from the incisal edge and that's where he resects the bone to. He sculpts the margin and, and re reflects the flap, brings the flap back and then sends the patient home to heal. The patient heals, they come back in, they probably have a suture removal appointment or whatever. And after eight weeks, she comes back in, her teeth are good and she still wants veneers. And I say, great, okay, we could do that. She wants white bright teeth, but now at least her gumminess has been decreased and we have a situation where, you know, uh, the teeth are the right length. So instead of short teeth and a gummy smile, she has normal length teeth and greatly de decreased gumminess to her smile. So we go ahead and we do the veneers and we place the veneers and she ends up with, you know, the white bright smile that she wanted. So this is before surgery, after periodontal surgery, after veneers, before surgery, after periodontal surgery, and after veneers. 
So we're able to get a, an acceptable result in the patient sides, which is by far the most important thing to me, by first determining what the problem was and then coming up with a proper diagnosis and in, in my mind, what was the best treatment option for her. And then in Laura's case, she's gonna see the orthodontist and the orthodontist is gonna go ahead and put brackets on. And uh, it's interesting about gummy smile. So what makes up a gummy smile? Well, studies have been done, including the Koch study from years ago. And interestingly enough, in the Koch study, what they found was, is that for lay people and for, for most people, when they viewed anything over three millimeters of exposed tissue, they considered excessive or considered gummy. And so Laura certainly fit that category. And oh, by the way, I mentioned I would, I, I said I would talk about this. So I was worried that even with the intrusion, she might still be pretty gummy especially posterior. And I felt like part of her problem was she had very a lot of hypermobility to her lips. So I did mention the fact that we had an oral surgeon uh, that we worked with and a plastic surgeon, both, that did a, a, called a, a procedure called a VY uh, chyloplasty. And what that does is it keeps the lip from elevating as high. But she wasn't interested. I, I said, would you like a consult? And she said, no, I'm, I'm happy with that. And over the years, she'd kind of trained herself to smile with a little bit less elevation. When you saw it mostly is on a spontaneous smile when she would forget and just smile really big. But most of the time in a post smile, uh, she could keep her lip from going up real high. But I, I mentioned that only because you might encounter in your practice sometimes somebody that has normally teeth and a gummy smile. And it could be because their lip just elevates a lot. And there are procedures that can be done pretty simply. And I know people say Botox. Yes, you can do it with Botox. And then the reason I didn't mention that as a treatment option is it has to be constantly repeated. And if you're okay with that and your patient's on board with that, or if you're doing it yourself, hey, that's great. But you know, the nice thing about a, a, the surgical procedure is pretty simple, it's pretty easy to do under, under local, and it's more permanent, just, just a food for thought. So here she is in her brackets, and here she is with the intrusion, and we're getting a pretty good result. The orthodontist has completed the work, the brackets have been removed, the patient's come back, you can see a lot of space there now, and you can see, she, you see on her full face there, she's not smiling. That's kind of her pose smile where she's trained herself to not smile as big so she doesn't look as gummy. But she's got short teeth. Now, so I showed you how we can do what Galit Garel called the uh, APT and what we call, what I call an indirect mock-up where you could do it. It's so much faster. It's so much easier to do if you have a diagnostic wax up and you have a putty matrix, you saw how fast, we showed the little video of how fast you can do one of those, okay? Well, in Laura's case, she find, she got a, offered a job in Arizona. I live in Alabama. She got offered a job in Arizona in Scottsdale and she took this job and she was gonna have to leave. And we had, I think three weeks, two and a half weeks, maybe two, two and a half weeks to complete the case, to finish her veneers. So I did not have time to get a wax up after she got her, her brackets off. So we were a little bit under the gun. So we did what's called a direct mock-up. It's more time consuming. It's a little harder to do. It's not as nice because I don't have a wax up or an impression of the wax up, but that's what we did in her case because we were under time constraints. So I just take, the reason it's different colors, I just take old composite in a drawer and whatever I, whatever I happen to have. And I just go ahead and shape it on the teeth because I need to make her some provisionals that we can do a post-op check with. If I take an impression of her teeth and make a provisionals of her teeth and she leaves with what she came in with, she's going to have these little short, ugly looking little teeth. So I need her to be able to speak with longer teeth. I need her to be able to function with longer teeth. I need her to be able to smile with longer teeth and tell me if she likes them, if she likes the color. And also we need a true trial smile. So I'll go ahead and do this direct mock-up. And just like we do with an indirect mock-up, we can take an impression of that, but we can, sorry, just unlike, we already have a still a putty matrix of an indirect with an indirect mock-up, but because we don't with a direct mock-up, I take an impression of that, I set it aside, and that becomes my matrix for provisionals. And then before we start prepping or take the material off, we do our depth cuts right through it. So it helps us be more conservative in our preparation. So we do the mock-up, we can do it without anesthesia, so we can look at her smile, we can have the patient smile, we can have them do phonetics, things like that. Then we take an impression, then we number up, and then we start the preparation. So we take all this, after the depth cuts, we can go in there and again, be very minimally conservative, and we do some very minor gentle recontouring just to try to get really 
nice uh, scalping and, and, and ideal gingival height symmetry. We're not raising the gums here. We're just doing some minor recontouring. So here she is, she comes in, we do the mock-up, we do the depth cuts, we do the preparations. She comes back for a post-op check. These are her provisionals that we made from an impression from the mock-up. And this is an interesting thing. I show this picture because one, it shows that, you know, we're, we're pretty comfortable here with, with the result. Again, she has a supposed smile. So when she smiles really good or really big, she's gonna be just a little gummier than that. But even then it's not too bad. But the neat thing about this is, her uh, provisional on number 13 came off. Uh, you know, they're very minimal preps and sometimes the, the posterior teeth, they bite into something that comes off. Well, you, I show this picture now, so patients, they go, well, females go, well, I don't know, do I really wanna do 10 teeth? And I go, well, let me show you something. You know, she's got five on the right, she's got four on the left, which would you rather have? So it's a great little way of showing somebody why I feel like 10 is better than eight. It just really fills out the buccal quarters on females when you do 10 teeth. And because this one accidentally came off, I, I wasn't smart enough to think to do it on purpose to show the difference between, you know, one side filled all the way out and the other isn't. But it was a neat little thing to show. And we could gain some valuable information doing our post-op check like we showed earlier, where we go through all the same things, uh, the phonetic exercises, the functional exercises, and the aesthetic exercises and feedback from the patient. And once we do that, we take pictures and impressions, we send that to the laboratory, and that's how we communicate with what we want. And then because we work with a really good laboratory and I have a great ceramist I work with, we're able to get a nice result and he makes me look good. And so our patient was very happy. She got these on. I think she got these on and left the next day. So we were really under the gun here. And when she came back, she had uh, something she had to come back for, and that's how we got the post-op pictures. Uh, she came back to Birmingham uh, to finish up some stuff she had to do. So, but anyway, we we're able to get post-op pictures. Um, they have called her and talked to her. She's doing good, but I have not seen her since the post-op pictures. But she seemed she seemed like she was doing good when we, when we saw her for the pictures, and she got a pretty nice result and decreased gumminess in the smile and longer teeth and a wider, brighter smile, which is exactly what she wanted. So we were happy with that. So there she is before and after. And so we had crown lengthening versus intrusion. We had altered passive eruption, periodontics for crown lengthening with Bailey and veneers. And, and Laura, we had wear with compensatory eruption, still short teeth and gummy smile, orthodontics for intrusion with veneers and befores and afters for both cases. So this is Paula. And this is an interesting case. This is a little bit different, one that you don't encounter all the time or we don't, we don't see all the time uh, because she had had some restorations done recently, okay? 10, to matter of fact. They're porcelain, they're all ceramic crowns, four through 13. And she comes into our office and for consultation, and we're just talking, you know, and, and, and we meet in the consultation room and we're sitting across a, a desk from each other and we're just, you know, having a conversation. And she tells me about what she's had done and the reason she's here. And she's saying that, you know, she's not displeased with the result. She thought, you know, the color, she's happy with the color and everything. She says, there's something about my smile. I just can't put my finger on it, but there's something about it that just doesn't look right. And I'm not sure what it is. This is what she's saying to me. I ask her to smile and it hits me instantly because you know, whenever you talk about smile design and you talk about smile design principles, one of those principles of smile design is the smile arc. And the smile arc is the relationship of the lower incisal edges to the lower lip. And in an ideal smile arc, especially in females, the smile, the incisal edges should be parallel to the lower lip. And the reason it's so important on females is because they naturally, they have more curvature most of the time than males do to their lower lip. So when you see more curvature of the lower lip and you see a flat smile arc, it's gonna be unattractive and it's gonna be unesthetic. But she, you know, she, she knew it was something in her, in her mind, but she just couldn't think, she goes, I'm not sure what it is, but there's something about my smile I'm not happy with. So I said, okay. I said, well, we'll go back here room and we'll take a look. And so we do, and we go in there and we, you know, I'm doing an exam and she's right. The restorations look pretty good. I don't see any problem with them. Uh, the marginal integrity looks good. We take a couple of radiographs, everything looks good. And so I'm going to explain to her what I think her problem might be. And I asked her, you know, have you, do you feel like sometimes your teeth are straight across and, you know, it makes your eye teeth just a little bit more prominent. And she said, 
Yes, I think that's it. I think I said, well, let me show you something. I said, can I, I'm going to show you something and see if that helps. So I know in the back of my mind, I can do a mock-up right on these teeth. It's not going to hurt the restorations. I'm just going to take a little flowable composite. I'm going to put it on seven, eight, nine, and 10. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put that on there. And you say, well, you know, did, couldn't you just do it with two teeth? You know, we might could have. But I felt like four teeth, I could get a better result. And I'm trying to do the least number of teeth possible because she's just paid a lot of money to have 10 restorations done. Okay, so I'm not trying to make a lot of work for her here. or I'm not trying to tell her, oh, you got to redo this whole case. So I'm going to do a mock-up to show her. And I got asked this question one time in a lecture, and I thought it was a great question. And the question was, I, they said to me, well, instead of lengthening your teeth, why do you just shorten all the posterior teeth? And I said, that's an excellent question. And I said, it's also a very astute question. And now I'm going to start incorporating it into my lecture because I'd failed to ever say anything about why I didn't use that as an option because it's a great option because then you don't have to do anything except just recontour some teeth. But the problem was it wasn't just the flat smile arc. I looked at her lip at rest. So I ask him, and a lot of times in an audience, I'll ask the audience, but I can't, can't really do that here. I said, I'll say, why do you think I didn't? And I said, what's the most important thing in determining a smile? And some people remember, uh, it's an incisal edge position. Some people remember Gallic Grell's quote, you know, incisal edge position is where we always start. And it is. And when I say it's where I start every time, I, I mean that. And it's kept me, you know, from making mistakes a lot of times. And it's helped me in cases that were a little tricky sometimes. So a lot of times, especially in females, because smile arc is so important, I'll just say, lip at rest. You know, I'll just say, I'm say, they'll either, I'll say, let your lips barely touch and now let them separate. Or I'll just have them repeat the syllable M, M, M. Either way, it gets your lips to just barely separate. And then I'll look. So what do you think we saw when we saw her smile? Very little incisor display almost maybe a millimeter. Well, I knew for her to have an attractive smile because she's pretty, even though she's a little bit older, 52, she looks great for her age She's and she's attractive. And I know to be attractive, she needs to show more incisal display than that. And I felt like she's got a little bit of, even in her smile that she's showing right now, that's a little bit of decrease in size display. If she showed more incisor, I felt like her teeth would, her smile would be prettier. So not only can we improve her smile arc, but we also can improve incisor display. That's why, I felt like if I shortened posterior teeth, she still wouldn't have an attractive smile. And that was my reasoning, but I still said it was a great question and it was. So the smile arc, the ideal smile arc has the maxillary incisal edge curvature parallel to the curvature of the lower lip upon smile. So that's what we're looking for, okay? If you have a lot of curvature, you want the incisal edge curvature. You notice that in females and on the left picture right here, this is a, a typical female smile with a lot of curvature. And you know, notice the dominance of the central incisors. That's what you want. You want dominant centrals. So it's, it's an attractive look. So that's what we did. So I go back to Paul and I show her, I said, you know, I'm trying to just explain to her that she's got a flat smile arc and decrease in size of display. So I want to show her what could be done. Well, first we'll do the, the diagnosis and treatment plan. So the non-conscious smile arc, we've already talked about, we want to increase in size or length of seven through 10 to improve the smile arc, but also to increase in size or length. But we're going to have to match the shade to the existing restoration. Oh, and I guess I should say before I tell you, these are porcelain restorations, okay? I think they were Emacs. I don't know if you in the audience have ever had to cut off a bonded Emacs. It's not like a feldspathic porcelain, which is pretty easy to, to cut off even when they're bonded because it's not, not real hard. But Emacs is like cutting zirconia. And then when it's bonded on, it, you have to just prep it off. You can't take it off like a crown. It's not like removing a crown, like a PFM crown or something. You literally have to bond it off. It is not fun and it's traumatic to teeth. So I don't want to cut off these restorations, but she wants, after the mock-up, she said, I, yeah, I definitely want to do something. So the treatment plan that we came up with to be more conservative, we know that you can bond porcelain to porcelain. I mean, we've done it success. I've done it successfully for years. I learned the technique years ago. A glass ceramic, you get great bond. It's a little trickier with zirconia. You can bond zirconia, but not as good as glass. You can etch glass in the mouth and you can put silane on it and you can bond zirconia. It's like bonding to etched enamel, okay? Very high bond strengths. And I can minimally prep porcelain for a thin veneer. 
because all I'm trying to do is increase length. And it's much easier to match a color because I can do a translucent porcelain. So I told her that the way I'd like to do this is I want to do four veneers on you. I'm not going to cut these crowns off. I'm just going to veneer the crowns you have. And, you know, when I explained to her, we'd done it before and whatever, she agreed to that as part of her treatment plan because I wouldn't have to drill off Emacs crowns and it would be much more conservative and less traumatic to her and her teeth. So we're going to use the, uh, uh, utilize a conservative restorative approach, which is what I just described. So conservatively veneer the existing porcelain crown seven to 10 to improve the smile arc by increasing the size or length and to match the shade of the existing crowns, which was easier to do than if I made four new crowns. So we're gonna do a mock up to visualize the end result and let her see it and determine exactly where we want the incisal edge. So in our mock up was not just to show her, but I was gonna look at her mock up at lip at rest to see exactly how much length I needed to add. So these are some restored smiles. And the thing you notice are four different female smiles, all with beautiful lip symmetry, all with, you know, all with 10 porcelain veneers, all with nice curvature of the lower lip. And even though where the teeth come in contact with the lower lip varies in every one, they have one thing in common, and that's all of them have the incisal edges parallel to the lower lip. And that's what we see in attractive smiles, incisal edges parallel to the lower lip. And it's really important in aesthetic cases and one of the things we strive for. But in Paula's case, that she didn't have that. And so we did our mock-up. And again, I just took flowable composite. I put it over the edges of the teeth. And I shape it with a burr and I hand her a mirror. She never got anesthetic the entire time, either for the mock-up or for the preparations or for the seating. That was another great thing about this case. If you're prepping a, a, a crown in the mouth, you don't have to numb the patient up. So that's another great thing because I can have her smile and, and have her look. So I hand her a mirror after the mock-up and I said, hey, what do you think? And she says, I think this is great. She said, that's, she, she said, you were right. And now she's showing a little bit more tooth and she has more parallel, you know, the incisal edges are, are more parallel to the curvature of the lower lip. So this pretty much just sold the case, you know, and she now because I she's happy, she doesn't think I'm crazy with a treatment plan of just prepping the teeth in her mouth. She thinks, well, maybe this guy does know what he's talking about. I don't know, but I guess I'm going to have to trust him now. So that might have been her thought process. So here are the teeth. Here are the preps. So they're very minimal. Again, we didn't have to number up. We put a little chamfer in there and her lip position. So she's never going to show the gingival mark. She's got gingival asymmetry, but I didn't really worry about that. And neither did the dentist before, I guess, because her lips just never going to go up high enough to show it. And because her lip doesn't go up very high is another reason she has decrease in size or display. Because if you look at those crowns, you're saying the crowns on the left, you look at these, you're saying those are at least 11 millimeters. So the laboratory that made them and the dentist is probably thinking, this is the same length I always make teeth. The problem is you didn't determine the size of the lip position. I made teeth 13, 14, 15 millimeters for them to look right. You have to get you know the proper occlusion and you have to make sure they have enough overjet and enough shallow guys. But you, as long as you don't lock them in, they can do fine. As long as they don't show it, it makes the smile more aesthetic. And so her case, even though these teeth technically were long enough, they didn't show enough and they were they it, it made it everything look flat straight across. So here's the preps, minimal preparations. And we isolate with a rubber dam. Now, one thing I do when I when I etch with uh, the yellow etch, the hydrofluoric acid. Uh, we want to etch, that's what you etch porcelain with. Uh, and Emacs, you only need it on for like 20 seconds, 20 to 30 seconds to etch lithium silicate. But we can use liquid dam. We just squirt it right on the tissue. Uh, a lot of companies, yeah, pulp dam, a lot of companies have, have a, a, a product like that where you can just put right on the gum and uh, it keeps the, the etch from in, inadvertently, you know, touching the gum tissue because it is very uh, caustic. And then after we etch, we rinse it off. You're going to have that frosty look of etched enamel. Now we're putting our silane on there, a silane coupler. And then after the silane evaporates, we're going to come back with our uh, universal adhesive. We evaporate the solvent in light cure. We put our cement right on the teeth. We see our restorations. Um, I think this is accolade again in this case right here. I think this is zest uh, accolade. So anyway, we go ahead and we seed our restorations. We wipe away the excess, just like you saw earlier with Ken. Here we are with our cotton rolls, wiping away the excess and the brushes. And we're going to just tack these right down. After we the cotton rolls and the brushes, we tack them and then floss. And then we light cure. And now we have four restorations that have been seated. And this is immediately post-op.
She hadn't put no lipstick on, no makeup on or anything. Well, if she wasn't numb. She didn't have to be numb. This is immediately after seating. So I said, oh, okay, let's go ahead and, uh, you know, let's take a look real quick. And she wanted to see the mirror. So we gave her the mirror and she's, she was ecstatic. She was really happy. She's going, oh, wow. You know, this is good. I really like this. And she was happy. You can see it in her eyes. So that was before and that was the after. Okay. Not a bad length before, but you can see how much longer they are after the before and the after smile. Flat, curved. That's all it was. It's such a simple thing. And it's, it's sometimes it's the subtle things that make a difference. Uh, an axial inclination. There's so many things in smile design principles that are so important. A canted midline. Uh, if the gum goes up, in a case like Bailey or, or uh, Laura, we were just looking at where their gum goes up and shows you, if you have gingival asymmetry, if, this, if one central is higher than the other, like you see here, I mean, in this case right here, you could see seven is higher than eight. That is, that's a, a bad no-no. If the gum went up high enough, we got away with it here. But here you can see eight's higher than nine. So in ideal gingival symmetry, the tissue, the tissue heights of the centrals have to be the same. The laterals need to be below that, and the canines should be on the same plane with the centrals. That's ideal gingival symmetry. And then the premolar is slightly below that. So there's a lot of gingival asymmetry going on here, but it really didn't matter. But if, if one tooth is too far actually inclined mesially or distally, that throws off everything. So it's not, the smile arc is just one thing, but sometimes these subtle things can make a big difference. Uh, buckle quarters make a big difference in female smiles. You saw that picture with Laura where, where she was missing, uh, the temporary came off number 13. And, and don't think it was because the tooth was deficient that it looked so bad because I didn't prep the facial of 13. And the reason I didn't prep the facial of 13 is because we did a depth cut through the mock-up and the depth cut didn't ever even get to the tooth. So all I did was put a chamfer on 13. So it wasn't deficient looking. I meant to mention that when I was actually showing, I apologize. I should have said that when I was showing the picture because people say, oh yeah, well that's because the temporary came off and the tooth is recessed because of the preparation. That wasn't it. That was how much we built her out. That was demonstrating how much better it looks when you build out the buckle quarters. And it's a reason why 10 teeth I mean, years ago, before I really learned anything, the first course I ever took, I had been doing veneers for a while and I thought I really knew what I was talking about. I did. I found out everything I learned, I learned taking a course. I I, I didn't know. I, I said, oh my gosh, I've been doing this stuff thinking I knew what I was doing. I didn't. I was doing six teeth thinking that was a great smile. And I didn't even realize what posterior teeth meant to the attractiveness of a smile. And I learned things like that. And a lot of times when you said, and I'm not saying that you, should make every patient do too. What I'm saying is sometimes given the option, they choose that because you can give a better result, especially with females when they get older because posterior teeth support soft tissue. And these posterior teeth, these premolars, or even a molar sometimes, it supports the soft tissue. Not only does it make their smile prettier, but it gives them a more youthful appearance in the lower third of their face. And they love that. They have had patients come back with friends. They said, my friend said I had a facelift. And I tried to convince them I hadn't had a facelift but they'll tell you that sometimes they will. So anyway, before and after happy patient and why a simple, you know, thing, it was, it's unusual in that, you know, we don't usually, you know, veneer crowns. It's a little bit unusual because, you know, we don't usually add length, but sometimes you can do that, uh, you know, to existing restorations and come up with a better result that the patient's happy with. And we've got a good, pretty good match to the other restorations without, telling her, oh yeah, I can fix this, but you're gonna have to redo your whole case. You know, that's not, that wouldn't have been beneficial to her or to me, you know, cause I would have never wanted to cut off one of those crowns, let alone 10 of those crowns. So anyway, that's how it turned out. And again, some of these things we're trying to show just to give you some ideas or some food for thought or some things you can do. And I'm telling you to go out and start veneering all your crowns, but it can be done. And I'll tell you another thing too, that's kind of neat about this technique is what if you have a, a long, if you ever had a long span bridge and, and they chip porcelain, you don't want to redo the whole bridge because they chip porcelains on, on one of the abutments or the ponics. You can veneer that if you have any porcelain to bond to. And even now with our new zirconia primers, they'll bond to metal. So even if it's a porcelain to metal bridge, you can bond, you can bond to metal now with zirconia primers. So you can repair a bridge in the mouth without having to redo the whole bridge if they chip porcelain. 
or if you know if it if you get some delamination off one of the abutments or ponics. So it's just it's a technique that could be very useful. I've had patients come in that have a crown on a posterior tooth and they want to do ten teeth, and it's a relatively new crown. I don't want to drill. And it's got we take X-rays, we we do a periodontal exam. They have great marginal integrity. Why do I want to cut off a perfectly good crown when all I want to do is build out the buccal quarters? I'll just veneer that crown and build it out. And I, and I don't have to put the patient through the trauma of cutting off a crown. So this is a technique that worked well in this case, but it works well a lot of places in the mouth. It can be utilized in a lot of places. You can do it with a porcelain veneer. You can also do it with a porcelain repair. Uh, there's some composites out there that you can, you can bond to porcelain and get some pretty nice porcelain repairs without having to redo the whole restoration. Just again, some food for thought. And this is our last case. And this is, I say this one for last because it's a, it's a pretty interesting case. And it's one that, uh, again, you know, I haven't had a lot to do with it, although she is my patient. Uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's a treatment option that I'd never done before and, and it really haven't done since. But I wouldn't hesitate to do it if the same thing, the same situation presented itself. So this is Meredith. This is Meredith at age 11. Uh, and Meredith is a horseback rider. And Meredith uh, was riding horse, her riding her horse and had an accident, got thrown from the horse somehow and got kicked by the horse in the mouth. So this is the result of an 11 year old girl getting kicked in the mouth by a horse. Uh, and I, I'm on the West Coast uh, and of course we were teaching out there and get a frantic call from her, from her mom. Tell me what had happened. They're on their way to the emergency room. And I said, well, that's a good start. So they go to the emergency room and they're seen by an oral, the oral surgeon that happened to be on call. And that's the reason they hooked up with the oral surgeon. So she calls me and uh, after they said they saw the oral surgeon, the oral surgeon did some you know, palliative treatment. Uh, I, I don't think she had sutures in her lip, although she had a lot of lip trauma and uh, made sure that there were any fragments, there weren't any fragments, there weren't any fractures or anything like that. Got all the little tooth fragments out and didn't have any jaw fractures or anything, uh, took x-rays and all that. And then she, I told her, I want, what I want you to do first is we're happy to see her in our office, but I can't really do anything that the oral surgeon had already done. But I want you to see my orthodontist because I want to consult with my orthodontist, but I want my orthodontist to see her first. So then we can kind of come up with a long-term plan about what we're going to do. So she gets in with the ortho for the consult after seeing the oral surgeon. And this is what she looks like. And so this is her, her first treatment, her first appearance at the, at the orthodontist. This is a, a couple, a few days after the accidents happened. So we're talking to the orthodontist. So it just so happens my orthodontist I work with here in Birmingham, Alabama is pretty well known all over the country. And uh, he's written textbooks. He's, he's published tons and tons of articles. Uh, he studied under uh, Bill Prophet at North Carolina, Chapel Hill, um, and, and, and got to know a lot of people uh, through his ortho residency. And one of the orthodontists he'd come in contact with over the years was a Norwegian orthodontist named Bjorn Zacherson. And it just so happens that they, in, in Scandinavian countries in Europe, they do a procedure called autotransplantation and it's fairly common there, very uncommon in, in North America, the US and Canada, you just don't see it, it's very rare. But they do that. And so my orthodontist was aware of that and aware of some of the cases that they had done. And we'd actually been to an interdisciplinary conference uh, where, where Bjorn Zacherson had actually presented a couple of cases that they'd done on autotransplantation. The reason I'm telling you this is because we had seen it, but obviously none of us had ever done that, but we're thinking, and what they had said at this conference, and when they presented these uh, cases, was they said the ideal age is around 11 to 13. That's the ideal age. And the reason is, is that if you're transplanting a central incisor, the, the, the ideal tooth transplant is a lower premolar because of the shape of the root. And you can reshape the clinical crown to look like a central, but the root shape is very close to a central incisor and they're easy to atraumatically extract. And the, at that age, the apices haven't closed yet. So they often get, uh, you know, re you know, nerves and blood supply. So the tooth will maintain vitality when they're, when they're transplanted. 
So all these things are kind of working in our favor. We're thinking, God, this sounds pretty good. And, you know, we start talking about it and we start consulting and we consult with the oral surgeon that happened to be on call that saw her and the parents, you know, or, or the dad's a physician. And we know that this, a couple of cases have been done in Seattle. And so the parents said, the dad's saying, I don't care. I'll fly her to Seattle. You know, if, if somebody's up there and the oral surgeon consults with the surgeon in Seattle and says, you know what, I think I can do this. You know, I, I, I'm willing to give it a try. So the parents say, okay. So that's what we agreed to do. We're going to, we're going to transplant. Well, I'll go ahead. I'll go through it. And I'll explain what we're doing <clears throat> when the diagnosis and treatment planning. So our diagnosis is traumatic avulsion of three permanent sizers. Basically it was seven, eight, and nine, uh, a lateral and the two centrals. Our treatment, and by the way, the cases we had seen were single centrals, where one tooth was a vulse, not three. So we had seen autotransplantation done for one central, but not three teeth. But anyway, we're thinking, hey, if it works for one, maybe it'll work for more than one. So our goals were, we're looking for a long-term aesthetic treatment plan, you know, with some kind of optimal result. And it could involve autotransplantation if, every, if everything works out. So the plan was basically <clears throat> to use the lower second molars, uh, I'm sorry, second premolars for the two centrals and then use canine substitution for the lateral because we're gonna, cause she's had a fairly narrow arch and she's got a little bit of crowding anyway. So that was the plan. So orthodox to properly align, then canine substitution for the lateral after the, after the teeth are transplanted. The great thing about autotransplantation is unlike an implant, you can move these teeth. These teeth can be moved orthodontically. So, you know, sometimes when you get an implant place, it's, oh, uh, you know, the surgeon will say, well, I had to put it there because that's where the bone was or, you know, but wherever it is, wherever it ends up, that's where it is. You got no options. You know, you just got to restore it where it is. So with a tooth transplanted, you have options and the orthodontist can move it. So I'm just, sorry, I'm just checking my time. I don't want to run over my time here. So we're, we're pretty good. And this is our last case. So we're going to finish up right about on time. So anyway, <clears throat> so we're going to use the lower second premolars. We're going to do, them, they're going to, the surgeon's going to do them one at a time. He's going to just create an osteotomy site, extract the tooth and re-implant it in the central site. And then we're going to hopefully, you know, at some point uh, do some porcelain veneers. But for the time being, we're just going to reshape the teeth with composite. So we're going to have the surgery involved, we're going to have the orthodontist involved, and we're going to have minimal restorative involved, certainly in the early years, other than composite bonding. So autotransplantation, the definition is a surgical movement of a tooth from one location in the mouth to another in the same individual. And this is, uh, some, like I said, you've seen some of it done, but this is uh, the first article cited there is that's uh, Bjorn Zacherson that I was referring to earlier, uh, the orthodontist that had presented some cases that, that my orthodontist and I had seen. <clears throat> so anyway, this is the first transplant. This was done about four months, so a little over three months after the accident. Uh, this is at the end of March. And the first one, he got it in a really good position. This is the premolar. And they go ahead and put a bracket on that. They're going to get this tooth aligned, get it in the ideal position. And then after about three months, they're ready to transplant the other tooth. Now you can see they didn't get this in quite as good a position. If this was an implant, I'd be complaining and saying, hey, what are you doing to me here? But fortunately, this is a tooth that can be moved. So the also says, no worries, we'll just move this tooth and get it in a little bit better alignment, which is what they did. So they're moving the tooth. They're gonna, they got the, the first transplanted tooth, number nine, in a good position. And now they're gonna go ahead and put a bracket on eight and get that tooth moved in. So here we can see uh, the Panorex, and you can see where the canines are. They got a little chain attached to number six that they're going to pull into and make that that tooth will be canine substitution. We'll reshape that to look like tooth number seven. And then we're still because of the crowding, we're still trying to get uh, number eleven into position. And you can also see the extraction sites on the lower second premolars, and they're just going to orthodontically close those spaces in. And you can see those they're starting to heal. So now they got the teeth in a good position. The orthodontist calls me up and he says, hey, I got this tooth in a pretty good position now, but they don't look anything like central incisors. Do you think you could do something? And I said, well, sure, I've been just on the sidelines watching, you know, you know, really excited about this case, but hadn't had a chance to do anything yet. So I was thrilled to get to see her to actually try to do something uh, to get, get involved somehow. So I said, yeah, send her on in. So she comes in. 
Uh, we take the wire off, take the brackets off the two teeth in the central incisor position and just do some composite bonding. Now I went ahead and I shaved down the uh, lingual cusp because central incisors don't have a lingual cusp. They have a, you know, a flat lingual and it's a little cingulum. And a dentist asked me, he goes, well, so those are the, the lingual cusps right there. He said, well, weren't the teeth sensitive? I said, no, in fact, even to this day, they're not sensitive. And even to this day, I'll just go ahead and jump ahead a little bit. These teeth are still testing vital, by the way. She had a vital test, vital, uh, vital uh, pulp testing done every six months for about six years. And when she went away to college, she started doing it like once a year. And she's uh, graduated from college now. And I saw her recently for hygiene and uh, she doesn't even, she hadn't had them pulp tested, she said in over a year, but no, no symptomology at all. And the lingual surfaces, she said, still unbothered. We're still trying to get her to do veneers. She's, I think about ready to do it because the bonding is starting to get discolored. And so anyway, we go ahead and take the brackets off and just do a little bonding on her right there. And the canines still aren't in yet, but we're ready for those. But at least they look a little bit more like centrals. And uh, so there's the bonding now. And you can see with an occlusal view right there. So you can see what we did on the lingual surface. We just took the, the those lingual cusps down and we polished them and put a varnish on them and, you know, coated them. And, you know, she was fine. She never had even a minute of sensitivity there. And they function a little bit more like centrals and look, looked a little bit better too. So here she is, you can see the spaces, the mandibular space starting to close in, the canines are starting to come in. I'll go ahead and flip through this. So here she is. So we started in January of 09 when the orthodontist first saw her and just a little over a year later, she at least looks like she has some centrals now. So here she is occlusally and space is starting to close in and canines starting to come in. And then here she is on the pan from January until March of 10, where she is. So now she's got her teeth in and we're ready to do some more bonding, a little bit more bonding. So we're gonna try to shape uh, the canine in the six, uh, the canine number six in the seventh position to make it look a little bit more like a lateral. And we keep doing a, some, every time she comes in, I take my dial laser and you can see right here, you know, she, her lip does go up and she has digital asymmetry here. And I take my dial laser and I raise this tissue every time I'd see her. And the next time she'd come in, boom, it's right back down. So what does that tell you? It tells me that this tooth is in the bone and the bone is further down on the right than it is on the left because every time I raise the tissue, the tissue comes back down. Why? It wants to be three millimeters from the bone. So that's where the tissue is going to be. So, you know, without raising the bone, which again, jumping ahead of myself a little bit, I'll just go ahead and tell you, uh, I've tried to get her recently. Well, she actually went for the consult about crown length in there, but she decided she didn't want to do it. And she's a little bit afraid. And I think the oral surgeon told her he didn't want her doing it, but you know, I look at it from an aesthetic standpoint. And if it's done this well, this long, I don't think the periodontist would take a little bit of bone away if he thought it was gonna be a problem uh, or if it might cause any kind of problem. But anyway, I'm just telling you that because if you go through these pictures, you're gonna see that eight is always shorter than nine. So here she is again. So now we've, we've reshaped six to look a little bit more like seven, but the general margin is too high because eight's down too low. So I'm not crazy about that. Here she is, just kind of walking you through her different stages. But here's the neat thing. The neat thing is, is that she doesn't need any implants. She doesn't need any bridges. She has vital teeth in all these spaces right here, which is pretty cool. And this is, uh, I think this is right when she went away to college. This is a picture we had when she was going away to college. And again, you can see eight and nine the imbalance there. Seven's looking a little bit better now. I think we redid the composite on that uh, to make it look a little bit better. But this was her going away to college. And this is her, I think when she was home one summer uh, before her senior year in college, I think she graduated in 19 or 20. But here she is and uh, she's had uh, jaw surgery. She had an anterior open bite and she had jaw surgery to close that. So closely she's in a pretty good position right now. And, I'm, I'm almost to the point of offering to do the veneers for free. <laughs> she'll just, she'll just do them because she's a little hesitant to do them. And 
I told her I'd make her a really good deal because I, I really feel like, and I wanted to do the crown lengthening and, you know, she hadn't said absolutely no, but she's kind of hesitant of that. And I'm going to have to maybe call the oral surgeon and ask him or the periodontist if he can convince her that it won't adversely affect that tooth if we do the crown lengthening. So uh, I, I feel like that to get the most, the most ideal, and, and you hate to come this far, I really wanted to do a little crown lengthening on, on five, six, and seven too, you know, and uh, eight, nine's okay, but five, six, seven, and eight, I really wanted to raise all that up just a little bit and then do veneers because I feel like you wouldn't even be able to tell it. she'd ever been kicked by a horse. Uh, but, you know, we, we'll see what happens, but here's where we are now. But anyway, it's, it's a little bit different kind of case. It's something that, like I said, I never encountered this before and haven't since, but if the case arose again, I wouldn't hesitate to do it, or I wouldn't hesitate to, uh, you know, you know, attempt a, a procedure like this because it would get, especially if it's somebody, you know, 11, 12 years old, you know, when, when you know you can take that premolar and use it for a central incisor uh, and get a pretty, pretty good result with it. So something to think about. And with that, uh, we may be just a teeny bit early, but there she was from January of 09 to August of 18. And uh, she's come a long way, but it's, it was a, a really fun case. So having said that, maybe just a couple of minutes early. Oh, no, I thought I was done. I'm going to finish right on time. Let me do, do one other thing real quick. I thought that was my last slide. Okay, so what, hap what do you do when you don't have parents that'll do whatever it takes and you can't transplant central incisors and you got no money and you're, this is a little patient who uh, was really kind of from a broken home and was playing basketball and got hit with an elbow, knocked two centrals out, and he's a football player, and his high school, the high school coach's wife is friends with my office manager. She calls her up one day and says, hey, we got this kid going around school. His two front teeth are missing. Could I just bring him over there? You know, he doesn't have much of a home life. He doesn't have any monetary means or anything, but I was just seeing what we could do, so we are thinking, oh, yeah, we could make him a flipper. Well, that's what the first thought is, just make somebody a flipper like this, because, you know, really, it's not much else you could do. You don't want to drill on teeth. But I show this procedure, something you can do as a temporary procedure, and you can use this little rib on fiber. You can bond it to the back of teeth, and then you can do a composite tooth. And, and you can bond the rib on to the tooth, to the lingual surfaces of the teeth, and then bond composite to the rib on, and you can make a tooth in a space. And that's exactly what we did in this case right here. We just bonded some rib on to the linguals of seven and 10, and we bonded some composite to the rib on, and we did the, uh, did that to, uh, you know, just give him some teeth. That you know, you could have given him a flipper, but this way at least he had teeth for a while until maybe later on he could do something or or have something more permanent done. But just so he's walking around school, and he's not walking around without two front teeth. And so we just did that for him, and it turned out pretty good. And he was happy. He had a big smile on his face, and it makes you feel good to see, you know, somebody like that come in and who's hadn't had a great life, and you know, be able to walk out with a smile. And I'm sure most of you people listening tonight have done stuff like this, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. He's a good kid, Eugene. Just a really nice kid. Don't know what happened to him. I've lost lost track of him. And then the last thing I will show you is a patient of ours. Mom calls frantically again. You know, it's on a Saturday. And so we come down to the office to see him. But he's horsing around with his sister. In the words of his mother, he's horsing around with his sister. And he lost a fight with the uh, kitchen counter. He, they were horsing around. He tripped and fell into the kitchen counter and fractured a central incisor. So we did what was called fragment reattachment here. They brought the piece in. They couldn't find the piece number eight, but the bigger piece number nine, they brought in with them. We clean it up. We etched this tooth. Now we do a pulp cap. We did a uh, viscose Theracal uh, LC. It's their light curing pulp capping material. We put over that, that pulp exposure. And then we relieved the fragment a little bit where it would come and approximate over that pulp capping because it's only about a millimeter thick. So we relieve the tooth a little bit. So we etch the fragment, we etch the tooth, we put a universal adhesive on there, light cure it. And then we take a, a, our bonding, uh, we took a composite, a flowable composite, and we hold it, the piece down with a lot of pressure, wipe away the excess and then light cure the fragment on. And there the fragment is light cured. So I asked the mom, she, she sees the tooth, we bond it back on and she goes, oh my gosh. She said, what are you gonna do with the other tooth? I said, well, without a piece, we'll have to do bonding. And the mom says, well, 
do you have to do it today? And I said, well, no, it's on a Saturday. I said, why? And she says, well, I want to go home and see if I can find that other piece. She said, that's amazing. So she's all excited. So they go home. Long story short, they can't find the piece. They come back on Monday and we have to do some composite bonding on the other two because they couldn't find the other piece. They never knew what happened to it. So there was the bonding. It's certainly not as good. So that's that's the beauty of fragment reattachment. It's it's what, you know, it's God and, and I'm not God, so I can't make it look as good. So if you can reattach the piece itself, it's, you know, you're never going to be able to do something that looks as good as that. Uh, he's been about three years now. The fragment's still attached. No pulp uh, sensitivity, no pulpal symptomology. And uh, the tooth has done great. So he's done fine. And uh, we're pretty excited about it. And we actually published this, uh, wrote a little article a couple of years ago about this case, which was a lot of fun. So with that, first question is, was periosurgery done on the last patient? And the answer is no. She hasn't had any but I'd like her to do some crown leaking, but she hasn't had it yet. Do you have to do any root canals on Keith? I think Keith had one, but it was on a posterior tooth and it was because it had a large restoration. He didn't have any root canals because of, of, of preps. In the case with the tetracy tetracycline staining, how does putting composite at gingival third affect veneers bond? It does not. You can bond a composite. I would rather bond to enamel, but I can get a great bond to composite just like I can get a bond to porcelain. So it does not affect, it does not adversely affect the bond at all, but we do put etch on the composite and we put our universal adhesive on the composite, like uh, evaporate the solvent and like cure. Wow, Bailey's case was a great result. With tissue reduction followed by bone reduction and then thin veneers, what is a price ballpark? Okay, my surgeon charges about $5,000 to do crown lengthening on 10 teeth. And then she paid, I think at the time we did her veneers, they were somewhere in the range of twelve dollars to $1,400. So twelve dollars to $14,000. So uh, somewhere close to $20,000 for that case. Uh, maybe a, a little bit more. Uh, or, I mean, a little bit less if they were 1,200 or 14. I can't remember. That case is about 10 years old. But that was a, a great question. Um, I don't see, wait, wait, there's another question here. Uh, what cement did you use to cement the veneer to the crown? Uh, we used a light cure resin cement because they were thin veneers. So we just used a light cure, I think it was Accolade, uh, Accolade PV, a porcelain veneer cement uh, by Zest. Uh, just a light cure veneer. Because remember, we cemented it to the crown, just like we are cementing to a tooth. And because the veneer we are cementing is really thin, we could use a light cure cement and cure right through it. Um, somebody said, great work. I really appreciate it. I, I hope you're still on. I normally wouldn't read that, but if, if the person, the anonymous attendee that said great work, I want to tell you, I appreciate that. It was very nice of you to say. Did Paul want to bleach the lower arch? Paul, that's a great question. Paul's ugly teeth. We're trying to, we've been trying for 10 years to do veneers on her lower teeth. She said, she keeps saying she wants to do veneers, but her teeth are so dark. I'm not even sure bleaching could help, but she's got a great smile. She's happy with, but oh my gosh, she needs veneers on her lower teeth. Something bad. Really good question. Which material do you use for bonding porcelain to porcelain? Uh, I'm assuming they mean cement. Uh, we use a light cure resin cement to bond porcelain to porcelain. Okay. So any light cure resin cement. I will, I'm gonna let you a little secret. A lot of times, sometimes I'll even use a flowable composite to bond uh, because a flowable composite, a light cure resin cement is basically a flowable composite. So we said, super, thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Have you noticed a difference in the bond strength and longevity of composite bonded to an existing porcelain versus a porcelain veneer bonded to existing porcelain restoration? No, I haven't. It's a great question. Uh, uh, because we don't bond to composite a lot. I bonded to porcelain and have had zero problems that I'm aware of unless they went somewhere else, unless I had geographic success, the patient moved and then had a problem. But in my practice, I haven't seen a problem with bonding porcelain to porcelain. I haven't seen problems with bonding to composite, but it's more likely because I don't think the bond to composite is as high as, as is the porcelain, but you can still do it. Good question though. Uh, yes, great lecture, but... Uh, too much information. <laughs> yeah, sorry. There's a handout. Oh, by the way, since somebody said it is a lot of information, anybody that's still on thomasdudney.com, my website has handouts to all my lectures. So a lot of this information uh, is in a handout form and you can go to my website. No, no pulp exposure when we took the lingual cusps off the premolars. No, no, no. Not only was there no pulp exposure, there was zero sensitivity. 
if you're if you're referring to Madeline on, on when we took the lingual cusp down. And I do it a lot too. We'll do a canine substitution in the lateral position. Then we move the premolar into the canine position. And when I restore the tooth, I'll 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 take the lingual cusp off the premolar in the canine position. I've done that a lot without any adverse problems. Repeat the name of the pulp cap material you used. Okay, it's called Theracal, T H E R A C A L L C. The L C is for light cure. It's by Bisco, Theracal L C. I've had a lot of good success with both direct and indirect pulp caps with Theracal. And the great thing about it is you can light cure it. It has a little bit of a learning curve. The main thing is make sure the dentin is moist when you put the Theracal on, it sticks better. Uh, how do you treat the pulp in the last case to avoid developing symptoms? We put, I just answered that question. Uh, the Theracal LC works great. What cement do you use for provisional? Uh, there are a lot of great, we use a non-eugenal temporary cement and there are a lot of really good ones out there. There's some, some really super temporary cement. I just I'll always make sure it's a non-eugenal temporary cement. Thank you everybody.